All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Domboski. I'm the municipal manager. So this morning, the mayor has been very clear throughout um, his campaign and throughout his tenure as mayor. We will listen to the people of Anchorage. We want to hear all voices, whether they agree or disagree. One of the most important aspects facing our, com our, our community right now is obviously COVID, COVID response, and what is what you're seeing on the ground. So today is the mayor's listening session. So much like an assembly, We'll get to come up to the microphone there's a little yellow button so when you get up here you can just hit it and then you'll be able to be recorded and we can hear you um, you'll have three minutes to tell your story the mayor or his senior staff to the right of him is Nikki Shabaka he's our HR director to the left of him uh, to the left of him is obviously Jamie Allard she's assembly member from Eagle River um, so as you come up and give us your testimony today and your experience and your perspective, senior staff will likely uh, follow up with questions for you. Um, we just want to hear what's on your heart and we want to hear your experience through this pandemic. Um, to the left over here, well, my left, your right, uh, we have other senior members of this that are here listening, um, as well as the mayor's chief of staff, Sammy Graham. And One of the mayor's senior policy advisors, Larry Baker, is to, just to the side of her. And our newest member of our leadership team, Joe Gerace, he's the, he is the director of the health department. <laughs> to the far, uh, far right, I'd like to introduce you to the first lady, Deb Bronson. And on the lower dais, we have uh, a member of our leadership team, Rochelle Alger. She's our purchasing director, and she's here accompanied with her husband. And then uh, Jamie's aide. Jamie, do you want to introduce your aide? Um, this is Brittany Tompkins, and I'm just going to brag just for a second. She actually is part of the person who runs Open Alaska on Facebook, so she's a pretty big advocate. So she's my aide. Thank you. Yeah. So with that, I'll stop talking. I just wanted you to know who's here. I do want to say a special thank you to John, who's with the fire department, who's running all the IT for us this morning. He's in the back booth. And we, thank you. And we also have a, a couple of APD officers who are kind enough to sit in with us to make sure that, you know, we can go through the meeting in a systematic fashion. And if anybody has any concerns, don't worry. The boys in blue are here to protect us. All right, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nikki Shabaka. He has a couple of opening statements. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Ms. Domboski. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. It is great to see all your faces, and I just want to applaud uh, your integrity, your courage. Uh, you are blazing a path, pioneering a path to embolden others to also step forward and, and speak out. Uh, so, so thank you for what you're going to share today. We want to make sure everybody feels comfortable. So please don't feel any pressure to say any more than you want to say or any less than you want to say. Um, we are going to uh, get ready to uh, say the, the Pledge of Allegiance uh, uh, in order to start. But before we do, I uh, also want to let you know I am at some point in the meeting, once we've had enough time for people to come in, I'm going to ask you all uh, a series of questions, about five or six, uh, and ask you to stand uh, for each of the questions and then sit down and stand again, depending on uh, if it applies to you, because I think that would also help us get a, a visual sense of some of what's going on uh, in our hospitals and, and elsewhere. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Assemblymember Allard. Thank you. If it's possible, Steve, can you come up front first? Yeah. Steve is a veteran with the VA, um, works there, and he's going to be the first to testify. He has a game today <laughs> that he's coaching. But if you could lead us off on the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So what I'm going to ask the testifiers is if you can introduce yourself, if you feel comfortable, your name, if you could tell us your profession, that would be great, and we're ready to go. And if you want to applaud, you can. Not with me. Um, Stephen, um, Zachary, I just came as a, uh, a joiner to this meeting. I wish to thank the Honorable Mayor Bronson and the Assembly members and support staff to allowing a platform for this community of citizens for their convictions, feelings, emotions, insights, fears, and education that come along with this season of pandemic, as it's so called. I have just a few minutes and I'd like to share with my insights as both a minister and a pastor from that perspective. I want to summarize the origin of what concerns people in the broadest sense. From collectively listening to all the stories and people that come to me, each person in their own way is going to come to you today with their own individual stories as well. But I would like to share a couple uh, with you. There are three brief main points I wish to present and I propose to set up like a fire triangle. Three elements oxygen, heat, and fuel are required for that fire. We have a fireman here right now. He knows us. So this is what I want to do. I want to set up the same way. So let me explain, explain this this way. There are three elements also I see that kind of surround all the periphery of what we're dealing with. I wish to point out again that alone some of these may seem immaterial or trifling, but I strongly suggest that when combined, they create quite a tempest. First one is contradictions. First one is contradictions. Number one, the origin of the disease. It's clear that for the record, nobody has had an issue with naming origins, particularly from diseases, of origi originating from the locations in which they've been. Some of us are familiar with this, some of us are not. Cases of example are Spanish flu, German measles, Zika, Ebola, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, etc. The list can go on and on. But lo and behold, as people come the same, why does the PRC have a say as to where and how this should be named? But we have swallowed this hook, line, and sinker. It's difficult for them. And so they say, uh, the second one is edicts from masking. I don't think as many people have come to me and counsel and for ministry and help and support that there's ever been an exact end to the amount of different edicts and recommendations that have been espoused regarding the wearing or not wearing of masks. People, quite frankly, are not interested any longer to hear, honestly, um, the views of the municipalities around them and the governing leaders, present company excluded, of course. Number two, the other element, hypocrisy. When people come to me and describe their angst and difficulties about this, they tend to drift about the subject without their, many have then seen instances of political leadership that say one thing out to one side of their mouth, and on the other, they're caught out of the limelight doing completely the opposite. Number two, an example in the case is the surfers in California. Still can't get that out of their minds, nor mine. When they're out there surfing miles out of sea, and they're, they're arrested for not having a mask on. I, don't, I still can't get a grip on that one. And the issue of illegal intruders into our country giving a pass for COVID testing and vaccinations also. But the citizens of our country, and most especially those who work in the federal government, don't have a choice. Those are issues we're dealing with on the ground. The third element, lack of transparency. One issue that seems to be bothering a lot of people is the apparent reluctance for those in the decision-making process, political, medical, administrative, to admit when they've made a mistake or simply to not having the answer. This is an acidic nature of enmity also amongst news organizations as well. Funny how they don't mind telling us that lives are at stake, and yet they don't collaborate together as if it really means something, that lives mean something. It's always the ratings. They're always competing with each other. So people come to me and say, I can't deal with the news anymore. I shut it off. Well, that's why we're not getting the word out, because people are tired of the um, examples of distrust amongst our media as a whole. So I thank you, my time is up, but I just wanted to th thank you. Hey, I just want to say something real quick, because I, again, I am here to, no, I, I don't, I actually don't have any questions. I just kind of <laughs> want to introduce myself. I'm Dave. Um, the, uh, 
uh, and, and again, I am here to listen. What we want to do is really capture uh, information, testimony like that, especially from the healthcare professionals here. That um, and we would kind of like them to healthcare professionals, teachers, uh, corp in, in, folks in the corporate world who have been threatened or are being threatened with the loss of your jobs. And, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not anti-vaccine, I'm not anti-mask. <coughs> um, uh, my thing is here is folks, we, we had someone uh, come into the office last night, we had a large group in the office last night, many of whom are here. Uh, a, a young lady came in and she says, I, I took the vaccine. She was a nurse, she says, I took the vaccine. She's, she's rethinking that. We, we don't care if you take the vaccine. In fact, a testimony that you took the vaccine under duress is, 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 is incredibly valid um, testimony for this. We're just here to listen and, and find out what's going on because we sure had a sense that the healthcare industry, the professionals that treat patients, you, um, were universal in your support of mandatory masks and, and mandatory vaccines. Well, that, that, I think, logic is getting turned on its head here. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. Um, I'm rethinking some things here because of what I'm hearing and what I've heard the last couple of days from you folks. So anyways, I just want to say thanks for, for coming here. I know it's a risk. Uh, you, you need to know the ground rules in the sense that this is being filmed because we, we really can't keep the media out. So we want to make sure we have an accurate record of, of what was said. And if folks, um, uh, and, and if folks don't want your face shown, we'll figure out a, maybe a way uh, with our production crew to not show your face. But if you're getting fired, you've already lost. Uh, you, you've, you've lost a, a lot anyways. And so we appreciate your, your courage. So, and it's what we kind of want to stay away from is, is um, and, and I don't mean to disparage, but we don't, we don't want to get into conspiracy stuff here where I, I don't do that. Um, I just, we just want information, heartfelt testimony on how you're jeopardized. There was one gal last night who's got several children and she's at risk and she's a sole provider for her kids. And, and, and she's also at risk, additional risk from this vaccine, uh, a health risk, and they just says, well, your, your life insurance is paid. And, and that's, that's what you get. That's pretty overwhelming. So anyways, I'll be quiet and I'm, I'm gonna listen. Um, so thank you, Mayor Bronson. I just want you guys to know that I support you. I don't, I'm exactly with Mayor Bronson in that, um, Personally, if you, I don't care what you do. Um, I just don't want there to be mandates. So I care about you, but what you decide between you and your provider, that's up to you and your family and your religious church. That's completely up to you. So what we're gonna do is, I was just gonna start in the front row and then we were gonna work our way through so nobody has to wait in line. Um, everybody will be able to be heard and be test to testify. If you believe you need to get out of here sooner, um, if you want to come up and stand behind that next person because you have somewhere else to be, we're totally flexible with that. I just want to make sure we can get to everybody's testimony. All right, and the first person in the first row, if you're ready to testify, and then if you just leave the mic on up front, that way nobody has to fiddle with it. And Okay, we have th um, three minutes? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> just kidding. Um, if you guys also testify or you just have written testimony or both, we would like to see your written testimony. We want to keep that with us too. So your written oh, testimony would be valuable. And again, if you have to leave sooner than later, if you come up to the front rows to testify, then we'll hit you sooner than later. Okay, I'm Robin Bjork. I'm a medical specialist. I've been a specialist for 25 years. Um, I'm happy to provide all of this information for you. When this pandemic hit, I was actually getting on a plane to go to the Middle um, East. Do you mind saying your name? If you Robin Bjork. And you work where? Uh, I'm, I'm in the Matsu Valley. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, so I was getting on a plane heading to the Middle East to um, present three different sessions for an international congress for specialists all over the world, okay? I have worked, you know, the last 25 
I have 30 years to become top in my field, okay? And presenting at all the largest um, national vascular vein lymphatic and wound congresses in the US, as well as international congresses. But now I stand before you because I have literally over the last year, it's taken me a whole year to deplatform and remove myself from all of those um, amazing top level things that I've worked at all my life. And the reason I did that is because of the harassment, the shaming, the threat against um, anything that I'm gonna say here today. Because I wanted to be able to speak freely without it negatively affecting my colleagues, those, those associations, and even the business which I founded, which is an international um, education institute to train physicians, nurses, and physical and occupational therapists all over the, the world. Okay, so now I'm out of all that so I can say this. Uh, like everyone else, I was on a group chat with um, faculty from all over the world, nurses, doctors, and so when COVID first started, I was like everyone else, you know, let's all join together and fight this and follow all the mandates and lockdowns and all of that. But here's just some of the research that has led me to the decision that a lot of other medical uh, doctors have come to, and that is that we are literally in some kind of a um, totalitarian uh, Nazi-like um, delusion of, it's like the Titanic of medical practice, and we are heading to disaster, and I'm not the only one. The vaccines are killing people. They have killed more children now, and it's only been a few months than in six months, than 10 years from the polio vaccine. This is not like other childhood vaccines. Um, we're being threatened with our license being taken away. There's hundreds and hundreds of studies on ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, but the government is blocking access to early intervention, preventative measures, and outpatient and home-based treatments that are critical to keep people out of the hospital. So when we see that there's people in the hospital dying, it's because we are not taking these approaches that are known to be effective. And like I said, I can't even get into this, but I'm happy to meet with you and go over all of this. Hundreds, hundreds of studies and top level scientists and medical um, specialists. So that's all I can say in three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Ma'am, if you wanted to give, um, if you wanted to give your research or anything to um, Miss Brittany Tompkins over here, my age, she'll take it. If you have any well, documents, you can have all of it, but, oh, there you go. But if, I'm happy to meet to help explain. Right, have her, we'll have you in the office. Have her I'm sure. Okay. Can the next person come up? And if you can say your name and if you're comfortable of who you're with and actually, your story. Actually, I'd like to not state my name and I'd like it not to be filmed. That's fine. If okay. you can give us your experience, that would be perfectly fine. Yes. Basically, I'm a registered nurse, been a registered nurse for 31 years. Worked in uh, air rescue and special operations kind of stuff for border operations. Just flew in three days ago. Had no idea I was going to speak in front of you, but thank you. It's an honor. I have followed you on the news and I'm very happy for your election and the support that you give the nurses. Um, so anyway, I just, threw, I just flew in three days ago from border and, and down there. And I can tell you without a doubt, the border's broken. It's, it's out of control. The stuff that's been going on down there is just insane. We have the border is just being overrun the hospitals are full of border patrol babysitting all the patients. The patients are running about 16 to 20%, and don't count me perfectly on my numbers because that's not my field of specialty, but it, it, all the illegals are, tons of them have COVID and are being put in the hospitals with babysitters with border patrol. Border patrol can't even do their jobs. They're being overrun. Everything is going insane on our border down there. And uh, I just spent a year down there working in those operational situation. And I, I personally am vaccinated as a nurse because I had to, you know, they mandated it. And I went ahead and took the vaccine because I'm ex-military and 
I had already walked the gauntlet of the line of getting vaccinations my whole life, and anyone in the military can attest to that. <laughs> so I've been shot up with so much stuff, I don't even know what it is. But that aside, I still believe the nurses should have choice because the nurses basically are losing their jobs. And when the suits were running out the door, the nurses were running in the door to take care of all these people. And that was before we even knew what it was, what was happening, how to treat it. We all put our lives on the line for that. And right now, I think it's the toughest time ever to either be a cop or be a nurse. <laughs> Both are probably the most dangerous. The only good thing about the nursing side of it is they're throwing tons and tons of money at nursing to go and put our lives on the line while they defund the police. My other feeling in it was that just, they're, they're not mandating that the illegals be vaccinated. They're busing these people all over America. I'm watching them put them on planes and they're putting them everywhere. They're just saturating Texas, Arizona, all the states with all the illegals coming in. And no, no mandates for them. But now you're gonna lose the jobs of the nurses who put their lives on the line in the beginning. And some of the nurses have legitimate reasons for not getting a vaccine. Say you are allergic to it, say you can't really do it. Is it fair that you can't be a nurse anymore and you lose your entire career? I don't think so. So like I said, I didn't mind being vaccinated. In a way, I felt like vaccinations did help because I've been exposed like you cannot even believe how much I've been exposed to COVID for the entire year with the improper PPE and all that kind of stuff. No pappers. I had a big beard down there. My N95 set out here. I'm in patients all day long. They're on vaporizers and all kinds of stuff. And luckily I was able to come back up here and test negative. I don't know, maybe the vaccine helped that situation. And I think the vaccine is not an evil thing, but there are definitely people who cannot take that vaccine and they should not lose their career for it. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I had no idea I was gonna speak. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Um, I'm Deanna Cressup, and I am from Chugiak, and I'm a nutrition consultant and a trigger point therapist. And I have been uh, trying to alternatively help people and educate them to get their bodies uh, healthy. And uh, the biggest thing that I can say is that we should not be forced to have a vaccination. If people want one, fine, but there's a lot of consequences with that vaccine and a lot of DNA and mitochondria uh, information that's kind of changed how the body works. And um, the biggest thing that I also believe is that the masks really don't work. People that are sick, they need to stay home, self-govern themselves and say, well, I'll wait till I'm better. But I also believe that the test that people get now, um, everything is COVID now, whatever happened to the cold, whatever happened to pneumonia, whatever happened to all the diseases that people did used to die in the flu. And so I, I'm concerned about everything being COVID. It puts the fear of God in everybody. And I do agree with so far with everybody who has spoken. And I appreciate you all uh, letting us ex express our concerns. And I am concerned. Uh, I had a cousin who died supposedly of COVID, but he came in with pneumonia to his doctor and they said, well, your oxygen level is 79. You need to go to the hospital right now. So he's in the hospital for three or four weeks, and um, he did sign for the uh, ventilator, and but he never got the alternative treat treatment, ivermectin, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and I think he would have had a way better benefit of living 
if the hospital would have allowed him to have that. Otherwise, they uh, treated him with the normal treatments and um, he died. He was only 61. And I just feel like that's too young to die. And I think the hospitals need to re-educate, redefine what helps people get better. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Suzette Oslin. I'm not a medical specialist. I don't work in the medical field, but I have a piece of information here that I feel a lot of people are not aware of, and that is we've got a bait and switch going on with these vaccines. You've got the initial vaccine that came out that was emergency youth authorized, and that's the, the vaccine that everybody seems to be getting, well, is getting. Now we have this FDA vaccination, that FDA approved vaccination that has come out. This vaccination is not widely available in the United States. So what people are still being injected with is the old EUA vaccination. You cannot mandate anybody to take that vaccination. It is an experimental shot. And that is something that people are not aware of. And Anybody that has a federal job or a, a health care job does not have to take the Pfizer emergency youth authorized vaccination. The only one that you can be forced to supposedly take is this FDA approved shot, which is called Corminity. And that one is not what you're, you're lining up to get right now. So people, if you're out there and you're being forced to do it, when you go in and you get the shot, make sure that it says on the label of that vaccination that they're trying to push into you the, the words Corminity. And th that is something that can s truly help a lot of these people that do not want to get this vaccination. That information is out there. It's on the internet. It's harder to find, but it, it is absolutely a fact. So look into it and, and be really aware of what it is that you are supposedly being vaccinated with. Thank you. Uh, just thank you. I just got a, 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 no, it's a question for the group. I, I'd never heard of this concept. Is, is, this, is this accurate? Yes. Is, yes. The Pfizer vaccine that has been approved by the FDA has only been approved, approved in a foreign country, not approved Victoria, in the United you, States. Victoria, first of all, I'm proud to say she's from my district, Eagle River. But if you could just say your name, if you're not comfortable with your last and your field of work. Thank you, Assemblywoman Allard, Mayor Bronson, and all the Assembly staff that are supporting us today, and all of the other nurses and other people willing to listen to our testimony. My name is Victoria Milterson. I'm a registered nurse with a bachelor's in nursing and biology. Both degrees taught me that I should always question the science. The science is never settled. I have been a registered nurse in good standing in the state of Alaska since 2005. During that time, I have had the opportunity to work in several different areas of nursing, including clinical research trials. During that tenure, I was responsible for asking patients to be involved in clinical drug trials. This was a rigorous process, as I was required by our own FDA to follow good clinical practice. By following our own FDA's good clinical practices, when I asked anyone to become part of a clinical drug trial, I would have to read out loud an informed consent which would lay out all the potential benefits and the potential risks of taking an experimental drug. I would give them ample time to ask questions. With that said, I do not believe the municipality, nor the state, nor even our own federal government are giving proper informed consent with or without an emergency use authorization. So I would ask that these following questions be answered before you mandate 
any experimental drug and or injection. Number one, can you please confirm that the injection you are considering mandating is not experimental mRNA gene therapy and or if it is a vaccine? Can you confirm that by receiving the experimental gene therapy, it will not prevent transmission? Can you confirm that I will not contract COVID-19 if I accept this experimental gene therapy? Can you please provide details and assurances that the experimental gene therapy injection has been fully, independently, and rigorously tested against control groups and the subsequent outcomes of those tests? Can you please advise of the full list of contents of the experimental gene therapy vaccine and its if they are toxic to my body. Can you please fully advise of all the adverse reactions associated with this gene therapy vaccine since its introduction? Can you please confirm that I will not be under any duress from yourselves as a citizen in this municipality by restricting my free and legal movement and from my employer within the municipality in compliance with the Nuremberg Code? Can you please advise me of the likely risk of fatality according to the CDC's own website should I be unfortunate to contract COVID-19 and the likelihood of recovery? I know I'm running out of time, but please let me finish. What preemptive interventions are also available to patients that the municipality is withholding by interfering between a doctor-patient relationship because of medical protocols? Are physicians in the municipality able to practice within their own ability to prescribe early interventions for patients without local pharmacies, pharmacies preventing a patient from fulfilling their prescribed medications? Thank you, I know my time is up, but once I have received the above information in full and I am satisfied that there is no threat to my health, I will be happy to accept your offer to receive this injection but with certain conditions, namely that you confirm I will offer, I will suffer no harm. Following acceptance of this, the offer will be signed by a fully qualified doctor who will take full legal and financial responsibility for any injuries occurring to myself and or from any interactions with authorized personnel regarding these procedures. Thank you, Victoria. I appreciate your testimony, and Victoria has been showing up every day. <laughs> so I appreciate all your support. Um, next, please. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you so much for all of you and your service. And my name is Michelle Zerby. I am the Sole proprietor of Liberation Massage. You can find me liberationmassage.net. And uh, I've worked for five years in chiropractic offices. Uh, one day before the national shutdown in March of 2020, I uh, got COVID from, uh, I think there were a couple of my clients that day that um, had it. One lady had a fever. Anyway, so um, I had COVID all the month of April. I did not go to the hospital. Um, instead, I cured it with my Rife machine, which anyone who wants to look at it later may do so. It is frequency therapy. It puts frequencies into the body that kill viruses and pathogens. It killed my COVID in five days after it had migrated into my lungs. Um, but the lasting effects of COVID, it's been a long time for me to recover fully. Uh, due to that, uh, when I work in my own business now, I do wear a mask when I give massage because my face is literally within 18 to a foot away from that person's exhaling mouth. So I exercise my choice as an American and I wear a mask. Um, however, I will never get the vaccine. I've had COVID. I think I've had it twice now. I think that a person should quarantine uh, if they have symptoms. And um, I will not get the vaccine. And so I ask you, um, where will this all end? 
Will people, will, will law enforcement eventually show up in my yard to come and take me away and force me to get vaccinated? If they do that, I'll die first. They'll have to kill me. Yes. We'll have a shootout on my lawn. Because if we don't have sovereignty over our bodies, we're slaves. And if you force us to get vaccinated, that's rape. It's the same thing as rape. This is why you see mothers and fathers get so angry when you try to vaccinate their children without their knowledge. So I just wanted to show you all just real quick because, well, I got 30 seconds. Please come see me. I'm going to stay till the end. If you want to know about this, it cures many, many. The, the manual is full, alphabetic ind indexed of every disease. It, there's every frequency set for every kind of cancer in here. And same as med beds, right, it's frequency therapy, and the big pharma cabal silenced it because it threatens their money. That's why I won't take the vaccine. Why are they pushing it so hard? Thank anyway, you. there's also many home groups that are meeting together, right wing, left wing, a big mix. Get yourself into a home group. You can talk to me about that too. I, I just need to interrupt for a second here. Uh, the, the gentleman with the vax uh, thing on, the American flag's been dragging on the floor here since you walked in. I, I, I ask that you fix that. Thank you. Um, before you get started, I just want to interject. I appreciate everybody's testimonies. I want to make sure that you guys understand we're here for um, individuals that would prefer not to be mandated as well. So I want to make sure we kind of stay on topic just a slight bit. Thank you. I'm Mike Alexander. Wow. Uh, I'm a retired nurse. Uh, some of you, if you've had a DWI, might remember me from the Anchorage jail. I was your greeting nurse. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I finished up my career at the state. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you bracked over two, Dave. <laughs> anyway, but the thing of it is, with the, also with the emergency thing on the vaccinations, Another point is, if there is a viable alternative, then it can't have an emergency thing. You can't mandate a vaccination. If you look at the latest numbers, the latest ones I have, from the VAERS report, which is people just turned it in. Harvard says it only covers 1%. It could cover 10%. But if you give it its best numbers at 10%, right now you have 14,731 deaths, the last number I had, attributed to this vaccination. If it's 10%, that means you've got 147,000 dead people across the country. You have over 350,000 adverse events. This is not swelling in the arm. I felt like hell for a couple of days. This is Gilliam Bears, where you're numb from the legs down, people walking like this forever because of neurological damage, because within 15 seconds, or excuse me, 45 seconds, this MRA stuff is in your blood system through the lymphatic system. So it does not stay in your arm and hopefully wait for the next time that you're, you're exposed to COVID and break in. That is there. So it's all throughout your body. It can cross the brain, uh, the blood, uh, the brain blood barrier. So that's where a lot of the neurological damages are probably coming from. This isn't going to hit everybody. It's kind of like anthrax was. The anthrax shot was during the Gulf Wars. It's more or less kind of a genetic thing. What is going on that day? Plus, we don't know what's in one batch to the next batch. It's not happen they do not have to label this stuff. So we don't have an idea. They might change the batch. You would never know. And so the mandatory somebody to do this in order to keep their job is just, I don't know where the legality of it comes because it's not there. It's just, there's no way you can have this as a legal mandate. And a mandate is not a law. And to fire somebody, we have never done that in this country. If I walked in and we just hired all white people today, 
we'd be on the carpet. I don't see this as any much different than that kind of a thing to where you're mandating someone to get a shot to hold a, get a shot to hold a job. And the vaccine appears to be not effective. The numbers we're getting to me are just completely made up as far as the percentage of people that were already vaccinated that are getting a second round of COVID. This could be, it's a virus, it mutates. So it's like the flu shot in a way. If it, if it was affecting you this year, and it was great and it held you, that's wonderful. Next year, it may not work. So I wanna thank you all for letting us have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. If we could just pause for one minute, I'm gonna have, Brittany is gonna call Dr. I call her Dr. Iona, but she's gonna call her on the phone. She's unable to testify in person, so she's gonna be called. Hi, Dr. Iona. This is Jamie Allard out here at the Assembly Chambers. Everybody's going to listen to your testimony. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. My name's Ilona Farr. I'm a family practice, 35 years practicing back in Alaska, 62-year-old Alaskan resident. I've treated well over 600 COVID patients. I lost track after 600. I've had zero deaths and approximately 20 people that have ended up in the hospital. I'm using the McCullough FLCCC and the Fleming protocols that include ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, and z -Pak, plus all the supplements, including vitamin D, zinc, quercetin, emergency, melatonin, and most importantly, aspirin to try and help prevent the blood clotting disorders, occasionally prednisone and nebulizers also. These things should be instituted throughout our city. A lot of physicians were using them last year. That's why we had many fewer deaths. Unfortunately, right now, MDs have gotten cowed into not prescribing this due to fake studies in the news. The pharmacies have also gotten cowed into not doing it. And there's only about five in the state and only about 20 providers in the state that will do these protocols. And we've also run into a lack of ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine because of supply chain problems. So I am really concerned now about this vaccine mandate. We're going to see a lot of job losses because of this. Um, and people are being forced to get vaccines or lose their jobs. And there's people that have some real contraindications to these vaccines. They have a history of clotting disorders, autoimmune disorders, they're pregnant, they're breastfeeding, they've had monoclonal antibodies, they've already had COVID. And as we know, COVID provides um, between 13 and 27 times better protection than this vaccine does. And in cases of people getting the Pfizer vaccine, like in January, um, they only have about a 16% protection from COVID. Now, the vaccine definitely does help decrease the severity of COVID, but in some cases, people who get COVID after they've had the vaccine will get the enhancement syndrome where their bodies will actually start attacking itself. Um, and this is what happened and caused a lot of the deaths um, when the original vaccine studies were done. With this um, COVID, um, there's already been 185 different strains identified, and um, some people have projected all the different strains that will be uh, coming through our communities over the next two years. So we need to get everybody um, you know, prepared. This is going to be a long-term problem. It is endemic. It is no longer a pandemic, and people are going to have to learn to live with it. Um, a lot of people are going to have to get this virus in order to get um, better herd immunity. But I'm in particular concerned because in my small practice, the side effects I've seen from the vaccine, including a 26-year-old with a stroke, a female, a 28-year-old male with seizures, a 42-year-old male with a heart attack, they, he um, survived the heart attack. They told him to get the second vaccine and he ended up with three days of chest pain. And um, I had a 50-year-old with uncontrolled muscle spasms for three months. So we finally used ivermectin, prednisone, and Mirapax to get control of those so she could go back to work. So these are some of the side effects that I have seen from this vaccine. And I am extremely concerned about this being mandated. It absolutely should not be mandated. I have been recommending the Pfizer vaccine because I've seen fewer side effects from it, especially over the age of 65 or over 50 with health problems and 
Some of my patients chose to get it younger, and that is their decision. We do not know long-term side effects in terms of fertility, in terms of autoimmune disorders or other things, because this is an mRNA and DNA. It is not a traditional vaccine. The Novavax that's coming out a couple of months is much more traditional technology. But again, we do not know long-term side effects of it, even though the preliminary studies look good. So I am calling to testify to say that these vaccines should not be mandated. They should be a person's choice based on risks and benefits upon their discussion with their physician. There's a very high rate of miscarriage in the first two trimesters, 83%, and they're seeing a lot more fetal demises with women that are getting these vaccines when they're pregnant. And so I have grave concerns about this. I realize that there are women that die with COVID um, also, but I have had several, four or five women now that are brand new mothers got the COVID right in the newborn period and their newborns and the mothers did fine. So anyway, I'm calling again to encourage no mandates at this point in time. People should take cautions as this is very serious and it seems to be attacking younger people more than the original COVID did. But again, I do not think this should be a government decision. I think it should be a very individual decision about getting the vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Iona. We actually have some questions. Um, Nikki, did you have some questions for her? Nikki Shabaka has some questions for you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Iona Farr. I really appreciate you being with us. Could you, I, I didn't hear, you said something about uh, what you've seen with pregnant women who have gotten uh, the shot and the effect on them. Could you repeat that, what you'd said about that? Well, I personally have not seen any fetal demises because I have not encouraged any women that were pregnant in my practice to get the vaccine, but I have heard from places around town that they are seeing an increased risk of fetal demise. In other words, babies dying after women get this vaccine and also miscarriages in the emergency room. And one study, um, I can't remember where it was out of now, showed 83% increased risk of miscarriages in the first and trimest second trimesters when women um, got the vaccine. Could you, could you um, send us that study if you're able to? I can see if I can find it again, yes. I, oh, somebody we, here has I go it. through thousands of different things a week. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Farr. Yeah, so anyway, give me a call back if you need it, have any other questions. Does anybody else have any other questions? No, thank you, Dr. Farr, you, you hit it all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. So now I have some questions for the audience, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think these are mostly going to apply to uh, to our healthcare workers here, and I won't I won't make you stand. Maybe you can just raise your hands, but this would be helpful for us just to get a visual sense. Uh, first of all, uh, please raise your hand if you have witnessed doctors at your hospital or practice failing or refusing to give patients informed consent about the potential side effects of the COVID shot. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm being told you, you need to stand. Oh, you need to applaud. Okay, if, if you can by sound, applaud, if that's, if that's what's happened. Okay. If, if I, I'm asking for eyewitness, yeah, uh, because that's, I think, the most reliable for us. Uh, please, uh, actually, if you could stand and clap, if you've applied for a religious exemption um, to not get the shot and have been denied. Right here. If you could stand and clap, right stand and clap for us, please, so we know. Okay, so we can pick it up. Thank you. Um, if you could please stand and clap if you've applied for a medical exemption to the vaccine and if you provide a documentation from your own personal physician stating that this vaccine could do significant harm to you with uh, potential bad side effects, but you were denied your request for a medical exemption. Please stand and clap. Thank you. Please stand and clap if you've been bullied, threatened, or harassed at work for not taking the shot or have seen others being bullied, harassed, or threatened at work for not taking the shot. Thank you. 
Thank you. Just two more. <laughs> Please stand and clap if you are being told that you're going to lose your job if you do not get the shot. Please stand and clap if you think the shot should not be mandated. Thank you. So if you guys can just give, um, we, I need to talk to these two gentlemen for just like 30 seconds. So if you can give us a minute and would you, she's pregnant, <laughs> she's tired. So she'll be the next to go. So if you guys can just give us 30 seconds. Um, Nikki's going to re, Mr. Shabak is going to re-ask those questions one more time. We want to make sure that everybody heard him clearly and we'll go through it one more time. So again, if any of these questions have affected you, could you please stand up and applaud? Let, let me interrupt here for, for, for a second. Uh, the reason we're doing this is, this is a visual thing. Channel 2 is here. You need to know that as a matter of, of for you make your own personal decision. Um, but we've been asked that we do this, this little question exercise again. So uh, I just want you to know so you have all the information. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Please stand if you've witnessed doctors at your, and clap. Please stand and clap if you've witnessed doctors at your hospital failing or refusing to give patients informed consent about the potential negative side effects of the COVID shot. Please stand and clap if you've applied for a religious exemption. We're, we're trying to help Channel 2 here. Channel 2, you ready? You're, you're filming. Oh, okay. Just trying to help. <laughs> Please stand uh, and clap if you've applied for a religious exemption to the shot and been denied. Please stand and clap if you've, been if you've applied for a medical exemption to the vaccine, provided documentation from your physician stating that the vaccine could have significant harmful side effects to you and been, and been denied the request for that medical exemption. Please stand and clap. Please stand and clap if you've been bullied, threatened, or harassed at work for not taking the shot or witnessed others who have been. Please stand and clap if you will lose your job if you don't get the shot. Or be granted a religious exemption. Okay. Please. Uh, so one of the things I'm aware of is some have set, have, have informed informed us that you will get a uh, you are being compelled or they're trying to compel you to sign a voluntary resignation as opposed to being fired for not taking the shot. Please stand and clap if that is true for you. Finally. Please stand and clap if you think the shot would be, the shot should not be mandated.
One more, one final question. Please stand and clap if you do not believe there should be a mask mandate. So we've had enough applauding to really put our assembly on edge next time. Okay, if you want to go ahead and stand up. Go ahead and speak. You have the mic. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Molly Morgan, and I'm opposed to the vaccine mandate. I've been a registered nurse working in Anchorage since 2013. I currently work for Providence. I received notification that I'm mandated to get the COVID shot in order to keep my job or I must apply for an exemption. I'm currently 21 weeks pregnant. My healthcare provider has advised me not to get the COVID shot as it has been associated with an increase in miscarriage, preterm birth, small for gestation age babies. There's been no long-term studies done in pregnant women nor on the fetus. As Providence stated, medical exemptions may be granted to caregivers who have a CDC-recognized contraindication that prevents them from safely receiving the COVID-19 shot. Those contraindications only include severe allergic reaction, anaphylaxis, after a previous dose, or to a component of the COVID-19 vaccine, or two, immediate allergic reaction of any severity to a previous dose or known diagnosed allergy to a component of the vaccine. It is clearly stated by Providence that they do not recognize pregnancy as a contraindication for COVID-19 vaccination. Is Providence going to assume the liability if I get the shot? Can Providence tell me 100% that the shot is safe for my unborn child? that my baby won't have a preterm birth, be small for gestational age, or that I won't have a miscarriage or late-term fetal demise? Of course they cannot. There's zero discussion about risk and responsibility of side effects. Providence is forcing me to choose my own body autonomy, medical freedom, and health of my baby, or my livelihood and health insurance. How is that ethical? I received notice that if I do not comply by October 18th, I'll be put on forced leave without pay for one month, and if I still have not complied by November 17th, I will be terminated. All communication with Providence has been forcing vaccination with no alternative. Frequent testing is not an option. Antibody testing to show valid proof of immunity is not an option. We have been told that the COVID shot does not decrease the spread but only mitigates severity of symptoms, then why isn't natural immunity respected in the same way? Yeah. <laughs> Medical coercion and discrimination are being disguised under the auspices of righteousness. I've witnessed bullying in my workplace. I've personally been coerced many times by colleagues to get the shot. I'm not anti-vax, I'm pro-scientific method. When we stop asking questions and blindly accept we are told it's the right thing to do, where have our morals gone? Thank you. Thanks, Molly. <laughs> Assembly Member Allard, I have a couple of questions if that's okay. Oh, yeah. Molly. Oh, not for, not for you, Molly, sorry. Okay. But I do have a couple Can of jumpers. I, uh, yeah. So this is going to be kind of a Q&A as, as, as well because we're trying to gauge where the public stands. Go ahead. Sorry, so um, I, there are a couple more questions for I, I have for you as the audience. Um, again, to your comfort level to answer. Um, but I ask that you consider please standing and clapping if you've seen uh, people marked down as hospitalized for uh, COVID who had gone into the hospital for other reasons uh, and subsequently left. Can, can I interrupt Jack here? Are you three nurses? Yes. So those are three nurses, nurses. that stood up. Okay. 
You're not a nurse? Okay. okay. Thank you. And then finally, um, uh, please stand and clap if you uh, believe that uh, the, the statements that the, about there not being enough beds or staffing for beds is inaccurate. Okay, um, maybe I'm gonna, if it's possible. The folks that are, you'll be able to come up and testify if you can just wait a minute. Um, the folks that are nurses and in the medical field, can you please remain standing? That he, the last, oh, the last question that Mr. Shabaka just asked. If you're a nurse, can you repeat the question? If you're a nurse or in the medical staff, please stay in the health profession. Yeah, if you're a nurse or healthcare professional, if you can please stay standing for a moment um, for that question. Do you want me to? to somebody, is there a different way I should answer it, uh, ask it to be more Beds accurate? Or staff. Yes. Beds or staff? Oh, I see. Okay, so let me let me let me let me separate that out. Sit down for a second, and only nurses and healthcare workers, please stand. Okay, and I know this is taking a lot of courage, so um, thank you. Uh, if please uh, please stand and clap if the statement that there are not enough beds to, uh, for, to handle COVID patients is not true or inaccurate. You gotta rephrase, you gotta rephrase that. Okay. <laughs> so let me, let me, unstaffed and licensed bed, licensed bed. If they're not, if they're, why don't you ask the question? I, number I, hate, I hate you to You know what I'm trying to get at. Let point Mr. Bosky point, go point ahead of and order. <laughs> Point of order, no. Um, you know, um, these are really valuable data points, but we have so many people here who want to give their testimony. I'm gonna ask uh, the ones controlling the clocks to speed it up a little so we can hear what you have to say as quickly and as succinctly as possible. With the number of people who have expressed interest, we may be here till like 10. So we, we have the room for a couple hours, so I just wanna get through as many people as possible, if you don't mind, Jamie. Thank you, Ms. Naboski. Okay, so I actually have three people on the line that are uh, on the medical staff. And Ms. Brittany, if you could go ahead and call all three of them in a row, one at a time, we'll get them for their testimony. Five? Okay, let's go through them really quick. Thank you guys for your patience. Say that again. It's up to you. Please use the area code when dialing this number. Brittany, do you want to just do public testimony since they're all down here and we can hold um, telephonic testimony to the end? Hello. Hi, is this Kristen? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Kristen, this is Jamie Allard at the Assembly. Can you go ahead and give your testimony for three minutes, please? Yes, are you ready for me? My name is Kristen Giesler, and I am a certified family and emergency nurse practitioner. I also have additional certifications in anti-aging, functional, and metabolic medicine. I have seen in the last two weeks over 110 cases of COVID-19 in both vaccinated and unvaccinated patients. What I'd really like you all to consider is that some people cannot obtain the COVID-19 vaccine for medical reasons. There are medical reasons not to get this vaccine. And unfortunately, there are many medical providers that are not giving medical exemptions for any reason. And getting a medical exemption requires provider documentation. Not all providers understand or are willing to give these exemptions. This places patients in a, in a vulnerable position of trying to establish with a provider that understands and is willing to write an exemption. The burden of finding and establishing with someone and obtaining a written exemption um, within the time frame of an employer, it's, it's like a Herculean effort next to impossible. And then your employer may not accept the medical exemption. What I'm seeing is just blatant discrimination in both the workplace and also in the healthcare field. I have witnessed 
discrimination in the emergency department with my own patients being turned away for antibodies because they are not vaccinated and no one has asked them the reasons why. I've seen discrimination in the workplace, segregation, daily testing, being treated poorly by employ employers, and even having testing at their own expense on a daily basis in patients that have had COVID and have natural antibodies with labs to verify it. I even had one patient recently tell me that an emergency provider told them that people who are unvaccinated and sick should not be entitled to care. Please consider keeping our rights for medical freedom a positive experience. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'm gonna do is, because we have so many people who wanna testify, if five people can go ahead and stand up, then we're gonna just go one at a time when it gets down to four, fifth person. Let's just keep five in a row, no more than that, because it'll just clog up the aisle. Um, Okay, um, and then healthcare professionals, we desperately need to hear from you. So if you can make sure that after these five, you guys start coming forward too. Okay, Mr. Imbriani is from my district too, thank you. Yes, thank you. My name is Louis Imbriani. Um, two policy considerations and then something for the audience. Uh, policy consideration number one is federal inmates, inmates who have been convicted of a crime murder, extortion, rape, child molestation. These people who have been convicted by a court, a jury of their peers, who are incarcerated in a federal facility are not mandated to get the vaccine. They're not required to get it. Just keep that in mind. Second policy consideration is the test itself. Um, I'll share with everybody, I had a severe facial trauma playing hockey. Um, I spent more time out due to the damage that the test caused me than getting sick. Um, think about it, ask the chief of police. For somebody who gets pulled over for a DUI, they can't just roll down the window and say, here, blow. No, there needs to be something that allows them to get that breath sample. And that's not being done with the test. There's no probable cause, no reasonable suspicion, and luckily, Anchorage School District kind of went away from that, but just policy consideration. All right, now for the audience. Um, so what do we do now after we leave this room? Everybody has a smartphone. I've been meeting with groups all over the state for the last year. I work with a group called Alaskans for Constitutional Rights. We are the local chapter of the Make Americans Free Again national movement. So if you are familiar with Make Americans Free Again, great. If you're not, please look them up. MakeAmericansFreeAgain.com. The thing that we are fighting for on a national level is personal bodily autonomy and freedom from medical tyranny. Please look them up. We have a group that meets once a month here in Anchorage, and we love when people go and meet in their own homes as well. If you want more information, please go to www.afcr1776.com. That's Alpha Foxtrot Charlie Romeo 1776.com. Thank you all. Jamie. So just really quickly, I accidentally said this, uh, we're here at assembly meeting, it's not. This is just a um, listening session between myself and the mayor. And if you could please warm welcome for John Weddleton. So he has joined us. He'd like to also hear from the public. Um, and then if the nurses, when we get down to four, if you guys can start lining up, I see a few. So thank you, go ahead. I just turned, okay, got it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm a nurse of 46 years. My name is Kathy Erickson. And um, in scripture, it says in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is obvious right now. We had an ethics forum at the hospital I work at, and it was clear that everyone on that ethics panel was not educated, did not take their personal or professional obligation to do the research. They were spoon-fed, 
and spewed rhetoric that's all over CDC and NIH, WHO, and their PowerPoints that they presented were askew with the data, inappropriate. And I, I can give an example just that they were talking about all the admissions for unvaccinated patients are this, and they're blaming the pandemic of the unvaccinated. Well, they started their slide that they showed from January of this year. How many people were fully vaccinated in January? Ask yourself. Fully vaccinated people aren't considered fully vaccinated until weeks after their second one. So that criteria that they used for that slide was askew. They should have started maybe in July when everybody had had to, to prove that this is a pandemic of the vaccinated. People are getting COVID variants. They do not recognize that it was an injection into the muscle as opposed to us naturally getting COVID by the respiratory means. So it teaches our immune system a different way to handle COVID. It's called OIA, OAS, or Original Anagenic Sin. But um, getting onto that, I was at the ethics forum, and it was just online, of course. The answers that they were giving, saying that smallpox was stopped by a vaccination. It was not. It was stopped by a quarantine and um, people practicing good hygiene, which is what we should have done with this from the beginning. And I only have 30 seconds. I have to make sure I covered. So um, I feel like the Hippocratic Oath has been sabotaged. Above all else, do no harm. I feel like the Nuremberg Code of Ethics is violated. And this is by the hospital who ended up in this ethics form. And for in this summary can be, well, you have a choice. You can choose not to work here. Thank you. Next. If you can state your name and work. My name is Julia Tennyson. I am a professional and trained journalist. And um, I'm concerned. I have allergies to medicines. I will not be getting vaccinated. Nobody can guarantee that I will not be permanently affected by receiving the vaccine. Uh, I'm more concerned about the assembly and any political body in this country thinking that their job as public servants has been changed to become a totalitarian, totalitarian type of organization. We're just people. These bodies are here to serve. We live in a free society. We were all born into it. And I don't see anybody on this assembly or any other political body that I know of clamoring to get into a communist or socialist government culture. So we need to definitely keep in mind that we're all allowed to be free. We're born free, and that's where we are. Sovereignty needs to be recognized. And I'm concerned very seriously about the media that's online and the national medias that are owned by big pockets that have big agendas that don't care about the little people like me um, who are doing fear mongering. I'm wondering why they shouldn't be sued for fear mongering, um, which is uh, fueling all of this, whether it's fear of illness or fear of something else. This is a bigger picture of taking freedom and making it illegal or telling people that it's wrong um, and convincing people to give up their liberty, give up their autonomy. And um, I think that that is my more bigger picture here in this whole thing is that it needs to not go away. I don't have a lot of, I'm not a nurse or anything like that, but I'm just really very concerned. This, this is called, America is called the, the great American experiment, great. People risk their lives to come to this country still because it's so great. They have so many people here that want to be free still and we shouldn't feel bad about it. I do have two children that have had intimidation issues at work about receiving vaccines. That's not me, it's them. Um, I have been a cashier at a local big box. I no longer work there. Um, they did not require vaccines, although I kind of see the rolling trend here, and it's not a good one, and it needs to stop. Um, I'm more concerned about encouraging my neighbors to realize that being free is okay, talking to each other is okay, being living life in fear is a life half lived. 
and I'm not going to live that way, and I don't think my neighbors should either. I don't think that my political bodies should ignore the fact that these people, you're just people. You're supposed to serve us, first of all and foremost, and being fear mongers for any reason is not a good thing. Thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you, and before you speak, I just want to put out, I really need the nurses and the medical staff to come forward so we can hear you. My name is Kelly Pendley, and I'm a nurse at a local hospital. Um, forgive me, I'm a little tired. I worked last night. Can you speak closer to the mic, please? I work in a unit where my patients are tiny and strong. I, I have been in that unit for 16 years. COVID has, of course, brought many changes. I've seen both fear and courage close up. I have seen some people grow closer, and I have seen a divide open up between others. I have seen child and parent separated, patients left without an advocate. I guess I never thought we'd be here, but in some ways I also saw it coming. Here, where employers and the federal government feel as though they have the ability to take away an individual's right to make his or own, her own decisions about health care. This is a hill worth dying on. We need to stand up for ourselves and for others. Bodily autonomy has long been recognized not only as a basic human right, but as a foundation upon which other human rights are built. In the medical world, the ethos of autonomy goes at least as far back as the Hippocratic Oath. And in the current day, the United Nations Population Fund states that respect for autonomy is a core tenet of international medical ethics. It is evil to coerce individuals into forfeiting their own autonomy in order to keep their job. The very people that have championed the ethic of autonomy in the past are forcing a medical choice on their employees. Throughout the pandemic, I worked. I worked extra shifts even, because my unit was short nurses almost every shift for months on end. I am not aware of any spread of COVID at all within my unit. Thus, the current safety measures are clearly effective and could easily just continue. It's actually pretty hard to improve on the record of having zero COVID in the unit. It certainly seems absurd to try to by force and coercion. I have been faithful to my hospital and to my patients, and I would appreciate it if my hospital would return the favor and respect my basic human right of autonomy. When we have to carry a shot card in our pocket and provide this shot card to our employer in order to participate in society or keep a job, that means that we do not live in a free country or have control over our own bodies. Regardless of your political affiliation, your religion, or your personal COVID shot choice, this trampling of basic human rights should rightly concern everyone. Thank you. I have a couple, uh, I have a couple questions for you. One of the questions is, um, how do the hospitals count COVID patients, and what um, unit you actually work in and has, I know, but they don't. The unit that you work in, are there any um, things that have happened to the moms? Uh, I probably don't work in the correct unit to tell how the hospital counts COVID. We've, as far as I know, not had a positive um, in our babies in the NICU. We have had some rule outs, which means maybe mom was positive. So when baby comes in, baby's put in you know, negative pressure room and you're wearing all the gear for up to about 11 days, they can be in that until they serially test negative. Um, there has been some separation of families. Can you elaborate on what you mean by the babies are separated from the mothers? It doesn't always happen, but it can happen if the mom tests positive, she's not allowed in the unit. And if, so if the baby needs the help that we can give, then they're separated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, please. My name is Kimber Miller. I've been a part of this community since 1995. Kimber, can you get closer? <clears throat> can you tell us your profession, please? Um, I earned my bachelor's degree in nursing here at UAA. 
I've been a practicing nurse for almost 20 years. I am against the mandates for the vaccine. I'm also against mask mandates. Um, I've received both Pfizer shots. I prefer to call them shots because vaccinations are meant to eradicate a disease. Shots are meant to decrease the symptoms. I also feel like saying that somebody is vaccinated versus unvaccinated is causing a huge chasm in our community. It's causing horrible anger and discrimination issues. Um, I really do not feel that it's okay to force people to choose between providing for their family, providing food, shelter, warmth, or, or getting a vaccine. What's it gonna be next? They're not gonna be allowed to be part of our community? Are they not gonna be allowed to go into the grocery store because they're not vaccinated? I have a big problem with that. I uh, also see the bullying in the workplace. I see it in the grocery stores where people are, those people aren't vaccinated. Look at them in there just spewing their, their spit everywhere as they eat their lunch. And it's like, you can't talk to people like that. That is a horrible thing. Right now, they're mandating for not just the medical workers, but you think about the housekeeping and the food servers and the, everything that it takes to run a hospital. And what's gonna happen? What does that picture look like? If in your mind, what do you think? 40, 30, 10% of Providence people choose not to get vaccinated or take the shot. They're already screaming every day in the Anchorage Daily News that they are so scared, they're so short-staffed, this and that, but yet they're willing. They're willing to lay off all those people. They're in Anchorage School District. They're willing to just fire people while out of the other side of their mouth, they're spewing that they're scared. They're so scared. And then just real quickly about masks, they don't work, I'm sorry. If it's a virus that we're talking about, <laughs> if it's a virus that we're talking about and you think about how a virologist looks like when they are working around what they even consider to be a virus, they are head to toe in bunny suits. These bandanas that we wear, why are they not being put into red bags? I mean, seriously, shouldn't they be a biohazard? Kimber, I so, have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So um, you're a recovery room nurse? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you want me to say the hospital you work at or no, not? No, thank okay. you. Okay. Um, at the particular hospital that you work at, are they still doing elective surgeries? Yes, ma'am. Do any of those elective surgeries take up ICU beds? You know, every surgery has its risks. Okay. You could come in for a colonoscopy and end up in ICU, so I can't say for sure. What about the heart surgeries? I don't. Those are some of those are elective. I think there's a nurse in here that had testified a couple days ago about um, you could do elective surgeries, and if you have a heart surgery that can wait up to six months, mm -hmm. um, they take up three days on the ICU beds, and those are still being performed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for this meeting today. It's fabulous. My name is Cecilia Preziosi. I am a dental hygienist and working. Uh, believe it or not, that's health care. The whole body comes into the dental office unless you have dentures, and still you have to deliver. So how am I personally and professionally and a community spirit uh, affected by this? I'm going to try to go fast. Um, I've been working since the 70s in my profession, and I put myself through college from the 60s. I've been around. Uh, I've been through AIDS, SARS, and everything else. And I have never, ever, and I'm from New York where we really had an AIDS problem. Um, so, and I've never seen this kind of tactic to handle an infection. And to go back to the mass discrepancy, okay, so let's think of a virus and what size we're talking about. A millimeter is the thickness of your hair. Viruses are kind of like the size of a micron, which makes uh, a millimeter look like a wall. 
Okay, so this is not doing anything. If somebody was really worried about me, they're not giving me a respirator. And as far as hospitals, I really feel for the employees there uh, because, uh, and my neighbor, I have a personal experience, they're in the 80s, and mom had to be in a hospital, and dad, who he, she's been living with for 60 years, uh, was not allowed to visit her. Why? Hospital personnel from the CEO down to the janitor, or to the janitor level, um, none of those people are quarantined. They're going to Costco with me. How come they're not quarantined to protect my neighbor or anyone else's loved one? Those people are infecting my family, my neighbors, just as if I was in the hospital visiting them, I would infect. Those people are no different from me. They're just as infected or just as infected as me. Um, so here's a little bit of medical thumb that I keep, uh, go, uh, that I'd like to offer. This vaccine affects everyone differently. Booster shots are really unheard of. Um, but what this vaccine is doing from autopsies, we're learning that these people have spike proteins. A nurse might be able to exp uh, explain it better, but a spike protein is something similar to an aneurysm. It's a bubble, so to speak, and it's ready to burst. What happens is that that person bleeds to death. Can I have three more seconds? Yes, you can. Thank you. When that burble, bubble bursts, that spot called spike protein bursts, you bleed to death. No symptoms, no nothing, you just drop dead. It takes about two minutes to do that, if that at all, depending where it bursts. You don't have any other symptoms but dying. Um, and they're finding a high rate of that in autopsies. And I am concerned I will not get vaccinated. I'm also, I can't remember when I've been sick. Over 20 years, maybe I had a cold. An, and then the, the other thing is, is that I, I keep a thumb of the things going on. I have patients that are terrified and they don't even realize this mask is not do, protecting them. It's a false narrative. Cecilia. It's a very false narrative. Thank it, you. You're putting somebody in a boat with a hole. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. I hope I was helpful. Thank you. Okay. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Don Hunley. Uh, I was in the Air Force for 21 years. I was in the Anchorage Fire Department for 20 years. I don't know if that qualifies me as a healthcare professional or not. I was wondering if I gave up my constitutional rights when the pandemic hit. Free speech, whether it's on the internet form or not, or in public, free travel, medical choices, I'm not gonna have a vaccine passport wherever I go. Sounds a lot like Nazi Germany to me. Mr. Mayor, I appreciate you're not buying into all the hysteria and the fear. Good job. <clears throat> I hear a lot about science. We always quotation marks it. I wonder why. And how the vaccine mandate people follow it. Well, you have to put your fingers in your ears and go la 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 <laughs> and ignore actual science. Like, there's, right now there's a brand new study that came from Israel that shows 13 to 27 times the protection for individuals that have already had COVID and recovered. Second, masks work. Well, there are several studies, you know, the science, that suggests that they don't on viruses. Treatments and protocols, science. The other day, Ms. Allard here asked the doc about treatments and protocols, and the gal couldn't answer the question. What kind of treatments and protocols do you guys give? I thought that was funny. I know, I actually looked it up, ivermectin works. Hydroxychloroquine works. There's science behind that if you want to look it up. I am not anti-vaccine. But if there's a risk to a vaccine, then there should be a choice and not a mandate. You 
You know, it's funny, I, I caught COVID about three, four weeks ago when I went into moose camp. I was pretty sick, but didn't have all the supportive care, but I survived it. Now, do I need a vaccine? Science would suggest not, but they, somebody wants to mandate me get one. Now, I was unable to get ivermectin, ironically, from two pharmacies and finally got it from a third. When's the last time you ever went to a pharmacy and asked for a prescription and they said no? Never in my life, but they did for ivermectin. <sighs> I was going to talk about the docs here that were here the other night, masked up and in fear, but I'm not going to go there. Um, what is it with this fear? Get your shot if you want it. If you don't want it, don't get it. Okay? Why do you got to be afraid? It's your choice. Start living your life. My son-in-law actively works for the fire department now. I retired, so I don't have to put up a lot of this crap that's coming. But he's had COVID, and now he's being threatened with a mandate. No. It's going to affect his kids. I got to ask something. What department? Anchorage Fire Department. And he's getting threatened with what? He's concerned about being threatened with having to have a mandate to get a shot. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Well, I'd like to hear that. And lastly, you know, I want to thank uh, support for the mayor, Salard, some of the staff. Uh, I was kind of embarrassed the other night for the assembly at, at large, begging for, you know, trying to get more time. And then they spent 10 minutes and wasted 10 minutes to give more time. And then they didn't give more time. Can't clap. Holding people down. Don't want to hear with the testimony from the people. I'm not saying necessarily anybody here personally, but that's what happened. So, thank you for support. Live your life. Fear not. Okay, we all know Dustin Darden. D Dustin, stay in lane. <laughs> Dustin Darden. My name is Dustin Darden. So, um, I wanted to speak a little bit about how uh, parents are dealing with their children and how their children are being dealt with and I do pray for them that they're having to send their children to a school where they're being uh, coerced to put a medical device on but there's good news today I have some breaking news that you may find advantageous to your child's education I Dustin Darden formally arrested Dina Bishop Tom Roth executive director of ASD the entire Anchorage School Board, along with Katie Grant, Secretary. And if you have discoveries of evidence where your child was coerced into wearing a medical device or intimidated to take an injection, and that would be anybody being asked to wear a mask, the Anchorage Police Department has the case 2125 0405. I'll repeat that again. You, you have discoveries regards to your child being coerced into wearing a mask, which is a medical device, which is a violation of Nuremberg Code, also coercing them into getting bioweapon injections. The case number, if you have a pen, write this down. 21250405. Furthermore, good news. Alaska Representative David Eastman has written a letter to the governor of the state of Alaska imploring him to encourage prosecution, this was on the 14th of September, of any report of violations of Alaska statutes 1176110. So Treg Taylor is now being implored by Representative David Eastman 
of the state of Alaska to enforce all complaints. And there are several complaints, including those of, of the number of which you're writing down now. So our children will be set free of this bondage. This is not segregated to a small body of people. As many of you know, these people are being influenced by global elitists. As you look at the news in Australia, Canada, UK, these same implementations are coming to our home. But I declare and decree this day in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that Anchorage will be set free through the hearts and minds of women and those with the courage to step up to tyranny. Thank you, Mr. Dark. If you can state your name and your profession, please, or not. Yes, hi, my name is Dean Robinson. I am a uh, family nurse practitioner. Can you speak closer to the mic, please? Sir? Sure. Dean Robinson, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work for South Central Foundation in the outpatient clinic. Uh, my statements reflect my own personal experience. Um, I've been there 16 years. It's been a good place of employment, and I work with some terrific care providers, and I, uh, up until now, have fully endorsed the, the vision and the mission there. Um, I have, we have a, a vaccine mandate that is in place, and uh, I will no longer be working there uh, as of October 15th because I am not, for myself, I've chosen not to get the vaccine. Uh, I believe that's a personal decision. And um, I feel like they have lost sight of where um, the organization ends and I begin. And uh, it's, uh, this is the first time I've, I've made a stance like that. Uh, I, I don't like it. I'm not comfortable with it. Uh, I'm not ready to retire. Uh, but uh, I've been told that um, my choosing not to get the vaccine is a form of um, voluntary resignation, which uh, I think, which is a, I don't know, a unique legal term that I'm really not familiar with. So um, regarding my care for patients there, I'm, I'm not anti-vax. My children have been vaccinated. I've been vaccinated growing up. This vaccine, I just wanted to tap the brakes on and get more information and see what comes down the pipeline. And that is firmly my choice. Uh, I believe when I'm in clinic, I'm asympt and I'm asymptomatic, I am not a health care or a health threat to my patients. Um, if I were, I wouldn't be there. So uh, at, uh, at the encouragement of my wife, I came here today to share that, uh, that testimony. I'm grateful for the platform, I'm grateful to uh, be here with all of you. Uh, I look at you and I'm, I'm encouraged and uh, I'm also saddened. It's a tough job. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Can you, um, if you're comfortable, state your name and, and what you do or where you work? Okay. Um, my name is Danielle, and I work as a RRN, and I uh, work outpatient currently, but I uh, worked in the hospital uh, in December of last year, and um, I was let go even with a medical exemption uh, because uh, I wouldn't get the flu vaccine. And uh, they said it wasn't, my exemption wasn't good enough, so I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna leave. I'm not gonna risk my health. So that's why I work uh, currently in the outpatient. But when I was working in the hospital, and I have to say I agree completely with Molly, <laughs> she, uh, she's, right, she's hitting the nail on the head. Um, so when this all started, uh, they shut down our unit for COVID. And um, it, was, it was just, it was a mess in the hospital. Um, patients coming in, they were already pretty sick. Um, they, and when it came to families, uh, they'd be calling, begging to come into the hospital, and we had to tell them that we couldn't have them come in the hospital. That was horrible. Um, and then uh, I got sick uh, this last November, and because my, I have medical conditions, um, my body didn't fare so well, and I would say I was in day seven when I knew I wasn't gonna make it. So I knew what the hospital does when it comes to their COVID patients. 
And so I told my family, I said, I'm going to be a DNR, DNI, and I, I'm refusing to go in the hospital because I have a better chance outside. Luckily, I was able to get hydroxychloroquine and ZPAC, and within six hours, I saw a, a turnaround. Without it, I probably would have died. I know as an RN and where I was headed, and I was okay with that, I would rather die in my home with my family by my side. With working uh, currently outpatient, and this I'm talking directly to these patients, they're coming in with shortness of breath, chest pain, peeing blood, um, their blood sugars out of control, and the and looking in their history, they had no prior um, history of that. So, um, and these people are in their 20s and through to, to their 80s. I mean, we had a 24-year-old just the other day that she's having all these signs and symptoms and she doesn't even, she doesn't even have any answers due to the COVID vaccine. And that's one other thing, with these people complaining about these things, they are directly telling me they believe it's from the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. Um, and, Another reason why I left the hospital, well, I, I didn't want to leave the hospital. I was told that if I didn't get the flu vaccine, then I couldn't work there, which was fine. But with what I see, have seen in the hospital, I'm glad to be out of there because I don't agree with what they're doing. But What did you exactly see? Just, Can you uh, give us a... They're, 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 when it comes to treatment, they, there were some people that were um, hypoxic, they were, uh, their action levels were low, and they were turned away because we just didn't have enough beds. So we had to triage the patients, and so we took the really, really sick people, but it, they were already too far gone. Even though they were treating their signs and symptoms when they came to our floor, there wasn't anything that we could do for them. We treat them with you know, the, the high flow, and then they go to ICU and get intubated but most of them didn't make it. Can you tell me again the reasons why you didn't have, was it the beds were unstaffed and unlicensed because you were short of staff, was it? I think it was a combination of everything. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Lawrence Brown, I'm here for Cece Matlock, nurse, 33 years, Matsu, she took the vaccine, wrecked her immune system. They got, she got COVID, she died one week ago. I'm going to the memorial right now. They gave her remdesivir. She went into renal failure. Guess what? She's done, dead. This is crazy, crazy. Don't take the vaccine. Cece, I'm gonna fight for you. Sir, before you leave, you just testified. Could you come back and give your information to Brittany Tompkins, my aide up front? The mayor would like to talk to you. Hi, um, my name is Sarah, and um, I am a pediatric nurse for the past 15 years. In the past six years, I've been working in pediatric oncology. Um, I wasn't really prepared to testify today, um, but I wanted to step forward because I'm another um, pregnant nurse working at Providence that I do stand to lose my job um, and then that is if my religious exemption is not approved so basically um, we can't, we can't hear oh, okay um, so I am faced with either I have to uh, submit my religious exemption by the beginning of October and that's going to be reviewed by some unnamed authority um, as it was stated very eloquently before, uh, Providence doesn't recognize pregnancy as a medical exemption. Um, all the providers that I've met through my journey so far have, you know, counseled me on getting the vaccine, and it's very stressful, you know, a lot of pressure and coercion from uh, my personal providers and, of course, everyone I work with, too. Um, and so, uh, sorry, I wasn't really prepared, like I said. Uh, Can I ask you a couple questions, kind please. of help you out a little bit? So what department do you actually work in? So I currently work in outpatient infusion. So okay. 
like I said, I'm in pediatrics. I'm no stranger to respiratory viruses, and now I work with the vulnerable population. So, you know, of course, I would never come to work sick, but Providence took away our sick time. Um, our union, I'm kind of hoping that they'll step up before the deadline for me to submit our religious exemption, but I guess I'm here today just to, t to appeal to you as the lawmakers to stand up for us individuals. I would hate to desert my, pop my patient population, but there's only three of us that work in our unit. Um, one of my other coworkers feels the same way as I do, so I would not want to sacrifice my future, the future of my family, just for this present that we live in. So you're currently caring, is that what you said? Yeah, you yeah I'm 26 weeks pregnant okay. now. Yeah. So are you aware that at J Bear that the military um, women that are pregnant uh, do not have to, that are in the military, do not have to get vaccinated until after they give birth? I was not aware of that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hello, Dustin Sherman. I left the white suit at home. Okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to give you guys kind of an insight on my trip down to San Diego uh, two weeks ago. So San Diego's got a population that's at least three or four times the size of Anchorage, right? San Diego's got 3.3 million people. Spent an entire week down there and I put a mask on one time. And that mask that I put on was just to fly down there. I didn't even put a mask on when I went in the hospital except for when I went in the room. And that's because the guy that was in there next to me was dying. So the thing that I'm looking at right now is if San Diego or California is no longer masking, why are we with the population that we have? And you can go into Costco, you can go into any store down there and not have to worry about wearing a mask. Nobody looks at you goofy. What I'm saying is if California is doing it and we hate California, why are we doing it? I mean, seriously, right? I lived down there for 10 years, and I know how they think. So, um, it, it, to me, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of asinine that we keep doing the same things, and we keep having the same result. Why keep doing it, right? Um, I've gone through COVID. By a show of hands, just curious how many people have had COVID. Are you scared of it? No. I guess the consensus, right? None of us are scared of it. We think that, you know, we're, when our time comes, our time's going to come. We're ready for it. I know a lot of other people are scared, but you're not going to... You're not going to be able to prevent this. It's, everybody's going to catch it. We're going to have to get through it as adults, and we're going to have to uh, do things like that. Now, there is good news. There are doctors here in town that will prescribe preventative treatments. I found one of them. He's been very good. Um, if anybody is interested, uh, they are taking new clients, new patients. They, ha they are a long-standing practice here in Anchorage, uh, and a lot of people that I've talked to know them. So uh, it's somebody that I trust with my health, and it's, it's somebody that I would send anybody else to. So if you're interested, please hit me up, and I'll let you know. Um, the one thing that does concern me a lot is our military. I, I'm, I'm having friends that are that have been in for years. Uh, one actually just moved from here to North Carolina and they're going to end up getting out and he's going to get out just short of his 20 years. That's very sad. The guy has served his, his country uh, very distinguishedly and, and he's going to have to get out because he, he won't take the, the vaccine. Um, I think that it's making us weaker as a country and it's opening us up to something very, very bad. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, if there's at all possible, maybe we make ourselves a sanctuary state. You've done it for guns. Something to think about. Thank you. If you're comfortable stating your name and your profession and perhaps where you work. My name is Dakota Jones. I'm a surgical technologist 15 years. I work at Alaska Native Medical Center for almost 11. I work at regional, or I've worked at regional and Life Alaska Tissue Recovery flying around the state. I work the off shift, so anything and everything can hit our doors. Our job can be very stressful. You must be versatile, which I am. I hop from service to service doing all types of surgeries. You name it, I'll get it done. In 08, 
I was out of work for four weeks because I had allergic reaction to a vaccine. 2019, medical waiver denied for the flu shot. 2020, denied again. Paralysis for four days, fever, cold chills, body aches, fever, blisters ripping across my face. Who am I to trust if I can't trust my doctor whom advised me not to get a shot vaccine jab because I had allergic reaction? What is the point of a medical waiver? I was denied twice for the COVID vaccine and for religion. I understand that if you have an underlining medical condition, the COVID-19 shot can bring it to surface. Who is to say I won't have a reaction that could cause me to be disabled or even death? I could throw a blood clot. I have family with heart issues. I could get an enlarged heart or have a heart attack and then die. That's okay. HR says I have a life insurance policy through Alaska Native Medical Center. Great. That's what I'm to tell my kids. I have a life insurance policy. They will be divided. They do not have the same father. In 2013, one of their fathers said in open court, he doesn't want them. So where do my kids go? Who takes care of them? They'll be divided and this will completely devastate my children. My niece is currently having severe menstruation complications and is seeing a specialist. She's only 24 years old. I'm currently still breastfeeding a child. I can't afford to get sick from an experimental drug. It hasn't even been proven to be effective. I've seen with my own eyes fully vaccinated people still being on the vent, still dying. The fetal demises, that's real. I also have covered the OB department, their shifts. The fetal demises are astronomical, but they'll deny it to you. Fully vaccinated mothers are losing babies, 19, 21, 24, 28, 32, even 36 weeks along. Nothing was wrong beforehand. I can still bear children. Have you ever walked a dead mother's baby to the morgue? I have. My daughter had COVID twice. She was in the company of fully vaccinated adults both times. Thank God her symptoms were mild. She was tired and couldn't smell. That was the only way in which we knew that she had COVID. We eat and drink after each other. We share the same fort. We sleep in the same bed. She sleeps on my pillow. We're face to face, yet I was not affected. I am face to face with COVID every day, day in and day out. I've seen how it jumps from person to person. It picks and chooses who it's going to infect and how. I believe in the immune system. Allow us the freedom to make our choice. My body, my wrist, my choice. But that's not even real. The mandate is unmoral and unethical. I have a childhood friend of mine. Her husband got COVID. He went to take his first shot because his employer re required him to do so. He suffered a brain stroke. Now he's blind. I'll take my chances. Still, it's my choice not to get the shot. I'm a single mother of five. I have two years left on my contract. I am not voluntarily terminating my job. I love my job. I help people for a living. We are already short staffed. My sister is working on her master's degree right now. Her subject, by 2030, we will be 300 million short of family doctors if this mandate continues to go through. Who's going to take care of you? Thank you. Haley. Hey, Haley, can you just hold on for just one second? We have um, someone on the phone that has got to go somewhere else. If we can, is that all right with you? Thanks, Haley. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please consult your directory and call again or ask your operator for your call cannot be completed as dialed please consult go ahead Haley my name is Haley Young and I'm a proud third generation Alaskan. I'm here today on behalf of my health and other Alaskans fighting to protect for our medical freedom. I believe that each person has the right to medical freedom, which is defined as the right to informed consent, self-determination regarding an individual's choice to accept or deny any medical intervention for themselves or their family. I completed my bachelor's of science and graduate internship at the University of Alaska Anchorage in nutrition and dietetics. I will begin the University of Providence Accelerated Bachelor's of Science in Nursing program in January of 2022 with clinical placement in Anchorage. 
My ultimate goal is to become a nurse practitioner and a nurse midwife. I will be attending nursing school in January, and therefore I feel it is applicable for me to share with you the American Nurses Association Code of Ethics. The Code of Ethics provides a statement of ethical values, obligations, and duties to every individual who enters the healthcare profession. The American Nurses Association Code of Ethics clearly states under Provision 1, Subsection 1, the right to self-determination, and I quote, Respect for human di dignity requires the recognition of specific patient rights, in particular, the right to self-determination. Patients have the moral and legal right to determine what will be done with and to their own person, to be given accurate, complete, and understandable information in a manner that facilitates an informed decision, and to be assisted with weighing the burdens, benefits, and available options in their treatment, including the choice of no treatment. They also have the right to accept, refuse, and terminate treatment without deceit, undue influence, duress, coercion, or prejudice, and to be given necessary support throughout the decision-making and treatment process. I am currently employed in the NICU at Providence as a clinical support tech. With the recent changes in the COVID-19 policy, I am at risk of being removed from the schedule and being forced to withdraw from my nursing program prior to even starting. Although Providence says to discuss the vaccination with my healthcare provider, they're the ones who ultimately are deciding whether or not I will remain employed based on my vaccination status. Due to previous medical complications with previous vaccines, my medical providers and I have decided that I'm not a candidate for the COVID-19 vaccine. That is my personal choice and a decision that should be made between myself and my provider. I'm currently working with my team of providers to submit a medical declination form to my employer, and there's no guarantee that I'll, it will be approved. Actually, I've already been told it will be denied before it's even submitted. I do not argue that the risks of this vaccine outweigh the benefits, but I also do not condone that the vaccine benefits outweigh the risk for all or for certain populations. I do, however, argue that my vaccination status should be private health decision between myself and my provider. As an American citizen and as a human, I must consent to any medical treatment, including vaccines, knowing fully what I am accepting to be injected into my body. It is my responsibility as an individual to adequately study, research, and seek advice from medical professionals prior to accepting any medical treatment because I am the only one who has to live with the consequences. For employers to use an individual's vaccination status as means of restricting their rights for employment is a violation of freedom and our constitutional rights as an American citizen. I will put everything that I've worked towards on the line in my education to fight for Alaskans because I feel so strongly about the right to informed consent, self-determination, bodily autonomy, medical freedom, and freedom as an American citizen. No person should ever be forced into medical interventions that will violate their will or personal beliefs. Just because an individual may choose differently than what is recommended or prescribed does not permit the discrimination or limitations of one's civil liberties or personal rights. Many people have died for our country so that we, the people, have a say in what happens to our body. And if we, the people, don't do something, our freedom will slowly be ripped from our hands. Please stand beside me and fight for medical freedom for all Alaskans. Thank you. Go ahead if you can say your name in the field that you work in. I'm Sarah Johnson, and I am a nurse at Providence, and this is my personal testimony. My testimony is not about anti-vax. This is about anti-mandate and freedom of choice. I have worked in healthcare for 26 years and at my current employer for 11, which makes them my second family. I absolutely love what I do, and I'll start with my own family. I carry our health and dental coverage through my employer. My husband had an injury in 2019. He's had five surgeries thus far, and still has two more to go as well as ongoing physical therapy. I have two children with one in middle college. I'm a nurse because I care about people. I've cared for many types of people with varying life choices, beliefs, and values. I have never refused to care for a patient whose personal preferences did not align with my own. I still provide the best care to drug addicts, alcoholics, murderers, racists. I've been hit, called names, spit at, and I've gone in rooms with highly infectious patients without hesitation. We allow patients the right to decline medical care, treatments, and medications. We allow patients to choose if they want life-saving measures should their heart stop beating or if they stop breathing. My sister Colleen died last year from cancer. I was witness to many errors and neglectful care while she was hospitalized for a month. She acquired many hospital-associated infections which means the care team was not taking the preventive measures that they should have. 
This ignited a new flame in my career. As a clinical nurse educator, I'm often the first to meet and train our new caregivers and our RN residents. This gives me an opportunity to be an influential role model and remind caregivers the reason why they chose healthcare. And remember that our patients are people and not merely tasks. We are so short staffed already and have had many caregivers leave healthcare altogether. Nursing students are being denied entry without this injection, which will further negatively affect the future of healthcare. It's not just nursing. We have housekeepers, dietary, maintenance, security, nursing assistants, physicians, and therapies that do not want to be forced to make this decision. We cannot provide optimal care without every essential team member fully staffed. People are scared. Imagine yourself in this situation. You love your job. You can support your family. You feel safe. Now imagine having to make that difficult decision to put something in your body that you may not want to or you cannot for medical reasons. We should not have to disclose personal private health information or divulge what we believe to be holy and sacred to our employer. For me personally, this use of power evokes emotion of abuse. I'm a good nurse, educator, and person. I'm a valuable team player. I believe this mandate will have ripple effects on our lives individually and throughout our community and country. If we allow the government to dictate what we do to our bodies, what will be next? We will refuse to care for patients who are not vaccinated? That is unethical and corrupt. We have traumatized many patients and families throughout this pandemic already. Take care of yourself because there will be no one to take care of you. Thank you. Thank you. Brittany, go ahead. Okay. My name is Ellen Shalafor. I'm a registered nurse at Providence Alaska Medical Center. Come October 18th of this year, my job essentially is terminated due to not, re not having received the COVID-19 vaccine. I do not believe that vaccines should be mandated. I believe they should be a personal choice. The option for religious and medical exemptions should exist. While Providence says that they are offering these to their staff, I have not heard of a single one being approved by the committee that Providence has made to determine if the person's exemption requests will be allowed. There have been several staff members in just my unit not to mention the rest of the hospital, who have recently gotten the vaccine because they felt they had no choice but to get it so they can keep their job in order to support and provide for their families. They have communicated that they are disgusted with themselves for taking that which they so adamantly did not want to receive. The choice that those who are mandating the vaccine are giving us is not really a choice at all. Get the shot or lose your livelihood and not be able to feed your family. The medical contraindication form that was given to staff who desire to have a medical exemption is so restrictive that one can hardly call it an exemption form. In essence, if you have had an anaphylactic reaction to a previous dose of the vaccine or to a component of the vaccine, then you may be granted an exemption. This does not take into consideration any medical condition or prior immunity. I currently have pericarditis, which is an inflammatory condition that affects the lining around your heart and can impact your cardiac function. And I'm in the process also of diagnosing an inflammatory autoimmune condition. The vaccine has been shown to cause pericarditis and myocarditis, which is the inflammation of the muscle itself of the heart in some individuals. It terrifies me what could happen if I were to take the vaccine with my current medical situation. I could end up in the hospital, or worse. I know a nurse who received her vaccine before Christmas last year and she is still unable to return to work due to the side effects that she is experiencing from it. From what has been communicated in the medical contraindication form, this nurse would still be required to finish her vaccine series to return to work were she to ever be cleared by her physician. In closing, I do not believe that the vaccine should be mandated. It should be a personal choice. Healthcare is not a one-size-fits-all model. It is individual and constantly being adapted for the next person that we meet. The fact that if I were a patient in the hospital, I would have the, every right to accept or decline any kind of treatment offered to me, but as a staff member, I am denied the same choice that I am required to give my patients is criminal. And I can allude to a question you had asked earlier. Do you know anything about bottle, bottlenecks at the hospital as far as... Um not being able to get into the emergency room? Are these normal, like is this normal? Do you know anything about that? 
I know the ER has been over full, but ER and like the adult units were full before COVID. This isn't new. Is it because of staffing? Uh, there is a big staffing problem. We are always short. Um, I work in maternity, so I don't see ma the main section of the hospital, but I get messages almost every single day asking me to come in and help work. And I know the other units are doing the same. Thank you. Yeah. May I ask a quick question as well? Yes, sir. Uh, you, you said you work in the what unit? Um, I work in mother, baby, and prenatal. Have you observed uh, anything as it relates to uh, mothers uh, who have had the vaccine, any impacts on them and, or their, ba their, their, their babies? Um, not directly yet. I know we have given the vaccine to our prenatal patients. Um, they're in the hospital because they are extremely high risk for their pregnancy. And in my opinion, injecting something that is not known for the end effects is not wise. Um, if we have a mama who tests positive, she delivers a preterm baby and they have to be, baby has to be in the NICU, that mother must finish her 10 day quarantine before she can even see her baby. She is not allowed to go to the NICU to see her baby at all. Oh. Thank you. Come on up, Nora. Thank you. Hello, I'll try not to take up too much of your time today, um, as time is valuable. My name is Noria Clark, and honestly, I'm quite tired of this. Uh, I will say the same thing that I asked Ms. Dembowski years ago when she was on the assembly. What is the most important commodity in life? That is time. Time is the only thing that we cannot get back, create, or get more of. And for us to have to waste our time on our freedoms that are inalienable is absolutely ridiculous. Now, I will thank you folks for being here because you actually listen and you have taken your time to pay attention to us as citizens, which was so rudely taken from us on Tuesday. That was very clear and very evident that certain people do not care about the citizens. Guess what? To all of those who decided to vote that way, we understand that you don't care. We took your names. So in regards to other things, as I need to speed up, um, one, I would like to know whom I need to speak to in getting my taxes back. I would like to have my property taxes back if there is going to be any mandates on anything that has to do with education. First of all, I don't have kids, so I'm still paying for everybody's kids because nobody wants a bunch of ding-dongs running around. But I think we need to start listening to the parents because, you know, I don't know, they might have an idea about their children. I'm not going and saying how to do things, but I'm willing to pay for it. So I want my money back if people are gonna keep telling me how to live my life. I'll go take my money and do it somewhere else. So in regards to ER beds, absolutely. That is exactly what this country was founded on, no taxation without representation. And at this point, I'm about to stop paying taxes. I don't know how yet, but I'll figure it out. So in regards to ER beds, I'm from Arizona. I'm from Southern Arizona. I can certainly attest to what the gentleman was saying about the border. I actually just looked it up. Tucson, Arizona is the biggest border patrol station in the country. Um, they may be calling that one that. It's actually probably the Casa Grande station, which is where I'm from, unfortunately. I can tell you the ER times there on a regular basis are 10 to 12 hours. So when I got COVID, I didn't want to go to the ER because I'd rather die. It is too long of a wait to die amongst strangers. Anyway, um, on to other things, subject matters, individualization. When it comes to these things, we need to break it down. So I think, and maybe at the end of this, somebody could stand up. Uh, if you're a medical professional and you find that there are maybe an, enough equipment, enough beds, could you please stand up? If those are beds, but unstaffed, meaning we have the equipment, but we don't have the people. Do you find that? Can you raise your hand or stand up? So we found amongst medical professionals, it is untrue that it is our lack of capacity to have these items. It is in fact a lack of staffing. So forcing these people to do that is not right. These people need to keep their jobs because we need you. Thank you. Thank and you, thank Clark. you.
Um, just before you start, is there anybody here that works at regional currently that's willing to come up um, in this line? It was just informed. Um, I'm not here. Okay. Not There's no mandates. Here, okay. Um, I just saw something that somebody just reported to me uh, that the wait time at uh, regional hospital is eight minutes in the ER. Keep in mind that. Can you come up? I just apologize for a minute, just because. I am not prepared, but my name is Tanya Osborne. I'm a registered nurse, 35 years. I moved from Mississippi in 2019 to Alaska Regional. I'm not a traveler and I didn't come as a traveler. Um, I work in the pre-op and PACU area currently. I, I can't really speak to the ER dynamics. I can tell you um, what I understand about those, those times is where you get somebody acknowledges you, somebody moves you to perhaps a room, or um, we had one of our, our nurses have to go to the ER for a personal issue and she was seen in a recliner. Um, somebody's acknowledging you or seeing you, but it doesn't mean that you're getting whatever taken care of. You may not see a provider and you're not gonna see a provider that quick. There's, not, there's too many things going on. Thank you on. for the clarification, thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Kristen Moser. I've been in the healthcare for over 30 years. I was an MRI technologist at ANMC for seven years <clears throat> up until last week. I am basically starting over with a new position at a new facility. I lost my job of seven years benefits and my health insurance for my daughter and myself. Not only those things, but I have lost my work community and a job that I really enjoyed. I pleaded with the hospital to consider my medical exemption. My doctor does not want me to receive the COVID shot due to my autoimmune conditions and possible flare-ups that could be debilitating to my health. The hospital's COVID-19 vaccine committee reviewed my health care provider's letter of exemption and denied her request to keep my body safe until further research supports its use and efficacy in autoimmune cases such as mine. They stated that the reasons listed are not medical contraindications to receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. The COVID-19 vaccine committee is basically making my medical decisions for me by denying my exemption. I feel that I was coerced to quit my job. I needed to consider what is best for me and my family as the sole provider of my household. The last two weeks of my time at ANTHC, I was sent letters of non-compliance with untrue facts such as evidence from COVID-19 vaccine studies and the vaccine's use in the general population continues to show that vaccines are safe and effective at preventing death and greatly reduce severe illness that can require hospitalizations, including the Delta virus. This is an untrue statement as I have three coworkers who are all double vaccinated and were recently diagnosed with COVID-19 Delta variant. I also received a letter called ANTHC COVID-19 Retention Bonus Program. This program is calculated by multiplying the number of eligible hours worked during the quarter by $5. Bonuses being paid out in two installments, one from July to September and the other um, from October to December. Employees receiving these bonuses must be compliant with the COVID-19 vaccine policy. In my opinion, that is bribery and coercion and discrimination. I am astonished. I am, a, I am astonished with a lack of empathy and compassion for the many that do not want to receive the vaccine. I am concerned that they will continue to push boosters, and I am wondering what, I, what will happen when boosters are mixed with the flu shot that is also a requirement for employment. My 19-year-old daughter is an employee of ANTHC and has received both vaccines. 
She had COVID in June of, of 2020 and has the best kind of immunity, but as in many cases, was offered the shot one day as she was working and took it. I will continue to fight against the mandates. I will continue to fight for the rights of individual choice. I will continue to fight for our country and what has made it great. Freedom and in God we trust. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you. My name is uh, Amy Hassler, and I work in the medical field. I've worked in the medical field for over 25 years. I'm not a nurse. I'm on the um, administrative side, but I work with patients face to face. And since COVID, um, I can almost say on a weekly basis, there's only two of us in our whole office who have chosen not to get the vaccine. Mine is for medical reasons. I um, get very sick with the flu injection. I'm never sick, and in employment in 11 years at one facility, I had been sick twice other than when I got the flu injection. So um, I was not prepared to come down here today, but as a staff person in my employer, I have been spoken to weekly since COVID hit about getting the injection, strongly encouraged to get the injection. Um, at this point, my job wasn't threatened. We have now been absorbed into a new national uh, company with over 700 offices around the US, and that is a possibility. Um, so I am looking at having worked in my employer for over 11 and a half years loyally. Um, everybody that's received the injection in my office are the people that are getting COVID. Um, I have, so, and I, and I have friends that have gotten the injection that have passed away. So the injection is not proven in efficacy. Um, so currently I, with this new employer, possibly will be losing my job. I'm a single income, so I don't have any fear over that. I'm gonna stand strong and I'm not gonna take the injection. But I just wanted to say that uh, on a weekly basis, I'm spoken to about taking the injection. I'm told if I don't take the injection, I have to wear my mask 24 seven, which is not healthy. Um, I don't mind complying. I'm in the medical field, so I don't mind because I'm, I'm the face of the company to wear my injection when patients come in, or to wear my mask when patients come in. I'll do that at the request of my employer, but I will not be forced to take an injection that has not proven itself to have any efficacy. So until that time, um, I may be un I may be voluntarily leaving my, I'm doing the quote thing that somebody else said, voluntarily leaving my company, not voluntarily. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, um, ma'am, can you do me a favor? We have some further questions for you later on. If you could go to my aide and give Certainly. her your information, we'd like to speak to you. Please come forward, your name, if you're comfortable with that, and your work and your background. Uh, my name is Tatiana Koenig, and um, can you speak up just a little bit and closer sorry. to the mic? Thank you. My name is Tatiana Koenig, and I've been a registered nurse for 15 years, and um, worked here in Anchorage at ANMC for eight years until I was terminated in December of 2019. Um, my my termination came as a result of the flu shot being mandated. Um, and their goal was 100% compliance. I submitted documentation from two separate medical professionals stating that based on my medical history and uh, my genetic predisposition to some uh, major issues and my father having had a, a condition that's incompatible with the flu shot, um, that I was not a good candidate for the flu shot. Despite this documentation from my medical providers, I was told verbally from HR that my exemption status was declined and that I had to get the shot or be terminated. We asked for something in writing from the CMO because things seemed suspicious as I had had three separate termination dates from the hospital. 
Finally, after two months termination, I received a letter from them stating you do not have any medical contraindications to receiving the flu vaccine. No contact or attempt to discuss any of my health concerns was ever attempted by the CMO before making this determination. I pursued the proper hospital channels to dispute this decision, which involved appealing to both the director of HR followed by the CEO. The day before the meeting with the director of the HR, I had my medical records pulled from the hospital to have a current list, and surprisingly, both of my medical recommendations that I had submitted were not in that file. I know for a fact that they had them. I have an email with them from them. At the uh, director of HR's meeting, he had a pre-printed template refusal letter with someone else's personal information on it that he had in his hands when entering the meeting. Same message, shot or terminated. Therefore, I appealed to the CEO of the organization. Uh, four months after termination, I finally got a meeting scheduled. During this time of waiting for a meeting with the CEO, I found a case study that linked symptoms that I had had prior to other injections, and I submitted that all to them. Um, he decided ultimately that he would pass it on to the CMOs, but once they reviewed, they st stood by their original decision. However, they did say that instead of the standard year that you have to wait once being terminated, that if I decided to comply, I was immediately rehirable. They say that they are doing this for the safety of patients, but they don't take into consideration that I am a patient also. How is it that two doctors who spoke with me and evaluated my needs personally that their professional opinion doesn't hold up to a doctor who has never ever seen or spoken to me. When they don't have any liability for their decisions, what do they have to lose? I was devastated to say the least. I believe that nursing is a calling and to have my job taken from me over a decision that I and my medical providers had come to is massive overreach. The fact that an employer had the ability to override what my medical providers had said is wrong. I loved my job. I have five young children and I worked nights, as many nurses do, and survived on very little to no sleep some days in order to provide for my family. I worked as needed and would wait to fill in my schedule based on what I, when I saw the needs were the highest. I was called multiple times, even after the start of shift, to come in um, because they were short-staffed and I did my best to do that. Like I said, nursing is a calling. The ability to do that being taken from me for choosing not to inject something that could injure my body is overreach. <sighs> I have included some of these personal details to provide a glimpse into a real life example of how there are two sides of a story. Now we're seeing the same thing happening with the current COVID shot. There are studies that show that there is no more risk to the patient if they are cared for by an unvaccinated versus a vaccinated caregiver. There should never be a time when, or a place when the place of employment should have the power to dictate that you have a medical procedure done which involves risks in order to keep your job. Fall, the fall season is the time when hospitals are the busiest. Now is not the time to be losing staff. I keep seeing that the unit at the hospital I worked at is short staffed and I think to myself how much I would love to be able to help out and yet my hands are tied. To the employers requiring this, stop being the problem and help create a solution Stop creating a staffing shortage by mandating something that is completely unnecessary for providing much needed patient care. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michael Pulis. I've been a resident of Anchorage for 40 years, a North Sloper. A little closer? Okay. My name is Mike. Just pull it toward you. All right. Very good. Anyway, I've been a resident here for 40 years, worked on North Slope most of that time. And what I'm coming here to talk about, by the way, thank you to everybody here. Thank you for having this meeting. Everybody, thank you. Uh, this really needs to be heard. I want to 
put two things out for research. Everybody needs to look into. There's a gentleman by the name of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. You've all heard his name. He runs an outfit called Children's Health Defense. I recommend you go to his website and look at what he has to say. Secondly, there's a term called graphene oxide, which is a component of these uh, injections and is a, a toxin. And we'll talk about that later. That isn't what I came prepared to talk about, but someone reminded me I should mention that everybody should look this up. Anyway, here's my, my statement. Um, the current COVID vaccines are not vaccines. They don't prevent you from getting the disease. They don't prevent you from spreading the disease. That has become obvious. Um, they don't deserve the term vaccine. I'll call it the shot from hereafter. What is being withheld from everyone, and it's not in the news and the public, is the death and injury toll. Uh, it is at least being partially reported in the CDC's own vaccine adverse reaction database. It, and that only reports about 10% of all cases because people don't report everything. They reported as of a couple of months ago, 13,000 deaths due to the shot. That means if you take that as 10%, that's actually 130,000. They had 613,000 medical injuries. That means you have to go to the doctor for some kind of care or to the emergency room or to the hospital. This is CDC's numbers that can be looked up. It's not my numbers. Um, why are we not hearing about this? Here's why. Why have you not heard of this? The pharmaceutical industrial complex, I think is a fair, because Pfizer made $22 billion this quarter, uh, and big tech own the media. Anybody turn on the news and see how many drug ads are in every single newscast? There's a whole bunch of drug ads at a quarter million dollars or more apiece. They have bought these people and they'll never say anything bad about medicine or about pharma. Um, yesterday's FDA hearing on the booster shots came out with a fairly negative statement that they didn't believe that they were advised for most people except in certain groups. And that was a surprise. It was an eight-hour hearing of an FDA, FDA board, and they did not suggest it because of problems with, with heart issues and whatever that have been seen with the vaccine. I had a personal event, uh, a federal employee I talked to recently uh, that I did business with who had had to take the shot to see his father in, in a nursing facility. Within a week, he had blood clots in his lungs verified by a CAT scan and is in, on blood thinners and is in, in a lot of danger. A week later, may, may I finish? A week later, I'm on the slope talking with a lady I know that worked with me a year ago. She was pressured in her office, last one, in the, she was an HR person, last one that hadn't got the shot. Oh well, I'll get the shot. She now has problems with her heart racing at irregular intervals, her carotid artery swelling up. She said, Mike, I feel it in my ovaries, I feel it in my joints at various times. I don't know what's going on. This is not a vaccine and it's not safe. I encourage everybody to look into graphene oxide and give Robert Kennedy's website a look. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Go ahead. Just like that? Okay. Hello, my name is Derek Shalafor. For the record, I want to thank everyone who's here, who's put this meeting together. I'm a lifelong Anchorage resident, and until July of this year, I worked as a chiropractic assistant, so I work in sort of the alternative health field. Currently, I'm a student. I'm not currently employed in any way, shape, or form that my employment could be threatened by this, but I'm here in solidarity. It can be difficult to decide which hill to die on, but when civil liberties are trampled, it becomes no choice at all. When the health and livelihood of one's friends and family are endangered, you run up that hill as soon as possible. For the record, I am in complete support of those who want to get the vaccine, who choose it, who need it, who want it. What I am against is the hospital mandates that will ultimately do more harm than good. I am not currently at risk of losing my employment as stated, but I am choosing to stand up for those who are. The overflow argument presented on Tuesday did more harm than good, though that picture was worth the price of admission. Yes, there is a virus, we are in a pandemic, and the system needs our support 
support your fire, EMS, support your nurses, support your doctors. But there are many avenues of treatment that are being ignored, such as the monoclonal antibody treatments and, pre and preventative lifestyle changes that were previously mentioned. Right now, Providence Hospital is at very real risk of losing something to the tune of 30% of their staff and creating another much bigger problem. The attempts for religious or medical exemption are being all but ignored. And as stated earlier, the doctors and nurses are required to allow patients to refuse treatment. It's their right to make a decision regarding their own personal health. To those whose jobs are at risk, that ch choice is being aggressively foisted upon them. The doctors, and God bless them, they spend a matter of minutes on average with their patients. It is the nurses who sit up night after night watching patients who are on suicide watch. It is the nurses who care for the children in the NICU. These nurses, these techs, all the staff, they're the lifeblood of the healthcare system and you deserve better than this. We are Alaskans, we are Americans, and we cannot allow any system to take hold that creates two classes of citizens or ostracizes those who've shed their blood, sweat, and tears for us during the pandemic based on their personal choice. So thank you all for giving a voice to people who are about to lose their livelihood over this and at least giving them a platform to speak. God bless you. Thank you. If you could do your name, your Hi, profession. I'm Becky Crawford, and I don't, I'm not a healthcare professional, but I work for a healthcare organization um, as a graphic and web designer. I work at South Central Foundation, and I've been there for 13 years. So there. Uh, they were one of the first to mandate vaccines, so I'm just going to share with you my experience since we're a little bit farther down the road. And so in May of this year, uh, SCF started editing job descriptions, reclassifying jobs and non-medical, from non-medical to medical, and changed the policies and procedures multiple times. Then on July 15th, SCF gave us notice that all employees and vendors needed to be fully vaccinated by the end of September or would, we would be forced to voluntarily resign on October 15th. They gave us just 15 days to submit a medical exemption request which required a doctor's note. I was able to turn that request in on time and also turned in a religious exemption even though SCF wasn't offering religious exemptions. Both requests were denied, as were everybody else's, um, and the reasoning was that they're not under federal or state law, but under tribal law, and therefore they're not subject to either. So I sent emails to the SCF board of directors and leadership to appeal the, to their humanity and reason and ask them to please reconsider or at least postpone this very serious decision to mandate vaccines until at least there was some time to allow for data to be better analyzed. With the exception of one VP, all my emails were either ignored or responded to with legal wording that said they, were bas they basically could do whatever they wanted and have made their decision and we have the choice and they emphasized our choice to get vaccinated or resign. Even though I'm not, I'm a non-medical graphic designer who has successfully worked from home now for 20 months because I haven't been allowed to go into the office to work because um, there isn't room for me because they spaced all the desks out and wear masks. I have natural immunity due to previous COVID infection, have medical and religious reasons to not receive the shot. They're allowing no accommodations and claiming it would create an undue hardship for me to keep me employed. And I see no one <laughs> from, my, from my office for the last year and a half. After it became very clear that leadership had made their decision and they were not going to budge or listen to reason, I felt compelled to let other employees know that they were not alone and to not be coerced into making a decision against their will. I especially have a heart for the young people that are just starting families and careers 
and have listened to many stories of young women and men, men too, at SCF, that still want to have families and are worried about future pregnancies. One example is a coworker that recently got her nurse's license and was finally working at a job that she worked so hard for through all the studies and was really struggling with quitting versus getting the shot. She reluctantly gave in and, and got both shots out of fear of losing her career and then realized a week later that she's pregnant. I'm so grieved about the coercion that is happening. In response to all this, a small group of us wanting to push back started a group chat, which has grown into a list of 77 employees currently, where we are supporting each other and sharing information. We held two rallies out front of the Alaska Native Medical Campus, and we invited the community, and over 200 people showed up. We have an awesome community here. Yeah. Both times we had a great turnout and had a peaceful demonstration and people were hugging and enjoying each other's company. And so since employees were being bullied and coerced and not feeling the freedom to talk about how they felt at work, my main goal was to just let other employees know that they were not alone. And, but it also caught the attention of our leadership, which was also my other goal. But unfortunately, instead of listening to employees, they hired more security guards and sent out an email to employees at the admin building that said extra security was needed, making it look like we were a threat. The, close, the closer it gets to October 15th, more and more employees are giving in to coercion and getting the shot to save their job, and a lot of others are quitting and finding jobs where shots are not requiring. Uh, required and causing you know a lot of nurses to leave and the I feel bad for any customer owners or patients at the that go now to get care uh, managers are pressuring their staff and hiring their replacements already I know my job is already listed I have not given them my decision and plan to hold out until the very end until they shut off my email and network accounts for not receiving the shot both SCF and ANMC are having a very hard time filling positions and are offering employees incentives to stay on and for non-hospital workers to work in positions that they're not even trained for. They're giving them a quick little training and having them even go into the hospitals and sit with patients and different tasks like that because people are quitting like crazy. Uh, the workplace environment has become hostile against the unvaccinated. A memo went out that unvaccinated employees had to wear masks at all times, and vaccinated people did not, so the unvaxxed are being discriminated against. They are classifying our termination as voluntary, voluntary resignation, which will limit our ability to draw unemployment. What they are doing is completely unconstitutional and they are claiming that they are not subject to the Constitution. Although I will be losing my job October 15th, I will not give up pushing back on this. I know it will be tough fighting tribal governments and federal governments, but I have documentation for all the statements that I'm making today. I now have an email list of over 270 community members and employees. And now my focus is on just coordinating with other grassroots, grassroots groups to have one large voice so that we can support each other effectively. And there's a lot of you. <clears throat> this, this is not informed consent. This is coercion and control. We're not being informed of the treatments that help people recover from COVID. We're not being informed of the risks versus the actual benefits for the shot over natural immunity. Instead, we're being coerced and bullied to consent with the threat of losing our jobs and other rights. We are shamed and fired for actually doing our own research because we can't rely on leaders to tell us the truth as uh, serious censorship is happening in the media. What is happening is wrong. It's not about fighting a virus. If people were actually looking at science and history, we would know what to do about this virus, just like every other virus we've combated in the past. It's about fighting for our freedom. We never had our freedoms challenged so severely and so rapidly as we are right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, for Becky. Listening.
Um, Brittany, um, just quickly, Brittany's going to call an ICU nurse. Is that correct, Britt? Can you call her? Okay. Hello? Hi, um, Kate, Hello? this is Jamie Allard. Can you, we're down here with uh, Mayor Bronson and his team. Can you tell us uh, your perspective and who you are and where you work or what your profession is, please? Yes, um, thank you guys for your time today and everybody that's in attendance there. Uh, my name is Kate Timmons. I'm born and raised in Alaska and I worked in the respiratory department at Providence for the last 11 years. Kate, I'm still currently a can you? Uh, yes. Okay. You have three minutes, so I just want to, you're coming in a little muffled if you might want to come off speakerphone, come off speakerphone okay. or I don't know what it is. Um, I'm not on speakerphone. Let's see. Can you hear me a little bit better now? I'm changing my position. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Kate Timmons. I'm born and raised in Alaska. I work um, in the respiratory department at Providence for the last 11 years. Still currently a respiratory therapist. Um, been kind of apprehensive about speaking out just due to where, to where I work and what my profession is. Um, but I feel that now's the time to speak up um, and I want to use my voice to help protect Alaskans' rights for medical freedom. I personally refuse to be forced to make a choice between providing for my family as well as helping you know, the community through with my unique profession. I feel like I shouldn't have to make that choice and sort of the skill set I've obtained over the last 10 years is, is kind of unique to Alaska and to be removed from that and not have someone be able to fulfill that position as well is, is it's hard on the community. So um, I don't want to have to alter my anatomy permanently and I don't think that's a fair decision that anybody should have to make for their profession. Um, you know, I've, I've personally strongly oppose this mandate based on um, my own personal research and choice and I'm not against anyone that chooses to take this vaccine or make their own medical decisions but I just simply want the equal right to do the same for myself and my own family. Um, I feel like Alaska has always been a strong community of people that are willing to stand up for freedoms and liberties. And I think going forward, we need to hold the line on this and demand our medical freedoms be protected. Um, if we don't, I don't know, I don't think our kids will ever forgive us for what, what we've lost. There's still so much that we can do here in Alaska and as a community, um, different therapies to look into that um, would be very beneficial to help eradicate this without infringing on um, basic human rights. And we just need to be proactive, offer solutions, you know, move forward with the therapies that we know that are proven to work and um, that are just sort of being politically shunned. And if we can start implementing those, we'll take off the burden, you know, that, that the healthcare system is facing. Um, sadly, there is no therapy for... Um, this divisive culture that's developing that's that's really becoming an issue in the medical field, I feel, to where employees like myself go to work and we feel like we're behind enemy lines because we can't speak up or we're frowned upon for our own personal decisions. And so that's something that, that's just going to completely destroy us if we don't come together and respect one another. So I'm strongly opposed to this mandate and... Um, I believe everybody has a choice whether they choose to or not, and I just don't uh, think that anybody should be faced with losing their livelihood or providing a skill set and a profession to their community based off of their own medical decisions. So I thank you guys for your time today and everyone who's there in attendance um, and the platform to speak. So thank you. God bless. Thank you, Kate. So um, because we've, we've been here for quite some time, I, we want to get through everybody. So I'm going to set the timer, and if you could just kindly see the clock and wrap it up so we can get to everybody, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Go ahead. The thing that I came in here to talk about, I think, has already been done by everyone else. While I still think it's important, it has been covered with enough dedication, enough... Um, losing the words here. It's been covered with enough emotion to be convincing enough, I think. But the thing that people are forgetting about is not adults, but children. Forgive me for being a little cruel, but I am sort of Darwinistic when it comes to adults. When I hear about natural disasters, I say, don't live there anymore. You know it happens. It happens every year. When it comes to children, when children gets, get hurt, 
it is not their fault. It is always, without exception, the fault of somebody who should have been paying attention or someone who should have removed them from the danger to begin with. The thing that inspired that was a news story. I don't remember if it made national news, but I knew it made, I know it made in the local news where it was. There was actually a 10-year-old boy who was very well-spoken for his age. I think even, even my own parents, who were grammar Nazis, you could call them, were impressed with him. And he was concerned about it, firstly because his teachers were hypocritical. I cannot speak for any other school in this, but at least at his particular school, there were teachers at 110 degrees, it was in Florida, kids wearing cloth masks outside in direct sunlight, their teachers would pull down their masks to yell at them because they were drinking water. Obviously, you can't do that through a mask. And I can see that less extreme here in our own schools. I've heard about it, my own younger sibling. It's ridiculous. There, I have to ask you sometimes what danger. People forget that children have extremely robust immune systems that need to be continuously tested. Not being exposed to viruses particularly the coronavirus, I suspect, will lead them to be particularly vulnerable to that in the future, because it's not going away. I suspect it's like, just like the flu. There already is a new, a new um, variant of it for the new year. On top of that, they're wearing masks. They can't see each other's faces. We're putting children, setting them up for failure. They're at the time where they are making the most social development that it is possible for a human to make in a given amount of time, and they don't know what their friends look like. That is unacceptable. It is inhuman, and it needs to be done away with. Going back to what danger, what happens when you don't let your children play in the dirt? Well, they grow up. These are the children that die from the flu. Now, not only are they not playing in the dirt, they aren't inhaling the breath of their fellow students. They're wearing masks. What's going to happen to them when they get anything? Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Bobby Menzel and I'm a special education teacher in this school district and have been an employee for 18 years. The district hasn't required its employees to get vaccines, but since they employ well over 100 employees, it's just a matter of time. Every day this is on my mind at work and I'm anxious with every dis district email that I get. Will this be the one where I have to choose? I will be honest, I have been back and forth about this, knowing the easiest choice and less risk to my financial well-being is getting the shot, but life isn't without risk. As an educator and parent, I teach my kids body autonomy to say no. If something makes you uncomfortable and doesn't sit right, say no. The other day, my son was told by an educator that the government owns his body. Before I could say something, my son said, no, the government does not. I own my body and so does God. <clears throat> I have been told by my colleagues that I am a danger to students, that I should lose my job, and that I am an uneducated because I am making the best choice that is best for me. If my 14-year-old can stand up to bullies, so can I. My colleagues' remarks hurt. I come to work, I've been hit, I've been kicked, and I still come in every day taking that risk because I have a heart for my students. Will this be a financial strain to my family? Yes, it will be, but my family is willing to take that risk. As Thomas Paine said, if there must be trouble, let it be in my day that my child may have peace. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Taylor. Can you introduce yourself, please? My name is Stephanie Taylor, and I'm a 50-year resident of Anchorage and a candidate for Anchorage Assembly. <laughs> the only positive thing that I have seen as a result of these mandates is that they have awakened a sleeping giant and created the momentum to elect Mayor Bronson. <laughs> Enough with the mandates. It's troubling to see how this has evolved from two weeks to stop the spread to now mandating medical treatments. The thing that has complicated this is the censorship of information. I long for the days of let's agree to disagree. 
The term misinformation is incredibly frustrating. Notice it's not called false information or lies. Anything that does not support the narrative of the powers that be is deemed misinformation. Imagine a world where criminal trials only allow the prosecutor to present their case. Everyone would be convicted. Or the reverse, where only the defense presents their case. How many criminals would go free? A sound and accurate argument should be able to withstand scrutiny and robust debate. The fact that this is being denied regarding all things COVID is very telling. Every week, new information is coming out which changes the rules. The bottom line is the, this vaccine is so new, they don't know enough about it. Earlier this year, the president said people's lives could go back to normal following the jab. How many times has that changed? It's not the government's or any employer's place to inject themselves into people's private medical decisions. That includes masks as well. One size fits all is not the answer. Individuals are more than capable of researching risks and benefits of any treatments and making a decision for themselves. These mandates are causing untold stress on people and division amongst people. Lost my place. We cannot see any more of our liberties eroded. No more mandates, please. Thank you, Mayor Bronson, for staying the course and giving the public a platform to share our concerns. Good afternoon, my name is Michael Whitesell and thank you for giving me the opportunity to give my uh, my testimony and my experience that I've, uh, with my current employer. Um, I, work, I work in medical, I'm an admin, and uh, for a large uh, outpatient clinic here locally um, that is um, federally, I'm a government employee, therefore federal service, and so they're mandating that we get vaccinated. My, uh, my date is October 8th. Either I choose or I choose not to get it. If I choose not to get it, they will, um, they have let, yet to tell me what will necessarily happen to me. However, we're allowed a religious or medical exemption. Um, but I've, since the mandate has come out on 12 August, I've reached out to my local HR, our executive leadership, our occupational health, and even the union to try to find out what are my options because I'm very conflicted with it. Um, I believe in personal choice. Uh, if you want it, good. If you don't want it, good. I'm not going to ask you. It's not my place to do that. That's up for my personal body and for me to determine what's best for me. With that being said, currently they came out with a mandate that's indicating at my facility that, um, and this is a nationwide organization that uh, ministers care to um, individuals, they indicated that any employee, volunteer, or contractor who works at the facilities will, or visits the facilities or provides direct care to those who serve will be needed to be vaccinated. So it's being very clear to me that the direction that we're headed is I'm going to lose my job. I believe in freedom, medical freedom through that process. And <clears throat> what comes to mind for me is this. I'm about to lose my job. I'm a sole breadwinner from my home. We have five people in our family. I'm going to lose all my medical insurance, and this is a fearful time for me. I've had people in the facility bully, be coerced into taking the vaccination. Numbers as we get closer to October 8th have dwindled from our large volume to where they are today. Um, I do have documentation that would indicate my correspondence back and forth with my HR, local leadership, executive leadership, national leadership in an attempt to get answers and they refuse to answer me or ignore me. So the reason why I came here forth is I believe this needs to be spoken and I'm just thankful that we have this platform. I'm hoping that I do not have to look for another employer. However, at this time and point I am because I do not stand for being forced into taking any vaccine. I'm not anti-vax, but I do believe that you have the freedom to do that. With that being said, I get to become uncomfortable being uncomfortable, get comfortable being uncomfortable through this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Michael, Michael, can you give me, 
Michael, you're federal, so I know where you work. Um, they weren't implying patients as well, are they? They're not implying veterans too, are they? At this time, they have not indicated that. However, okay. uh, with the current uh, state that they're doing, I wouldn't be too inclined that that would follow pretty soon. Make sure you follow up with Senator Sullivan. Congressional has been filed. Thank you. Um, Brittany's going to go ahead and get somebody on the line for us. What? Please use the area code when dialing this number. Molly. Hey, Molly, this is Jamie Allard. Uh, the mayor and I are in a lesson, listening session. Can you go ahead and testify for three minutes? Yes, absolutely. And can you please My identify um, your uh, profession? Yes. My name is Molly Swanson, and I am a nurse at a &MC until the vaccine deadline of October 15th. I also volunteer as an EMT and firefighter in the community, and I'm currently on duty, which is why I am unable to be there and to testify in person today. Just over a year ago, we were taking care of COVID patients and were viewed as heroes, but now many of us who worked directly with COVID for all of this time are losing our jobs if we make an informed personal healthcare decision not to receive an injection that has many concerning known and unknown adverse reactions. We were told we were compassionate, brave, caring, and valued. Now we're being told that to be all those things, you must be vaccinated. After years of education and experience, we're told we need to be re-educated and that our specific concerns about these experimental gene technology vaccines are unfounded and irrational. The use of coercion, guilt, and desperation makes people feel they have no other choice. There are so many of my fellow nurses and Alaskans who feel getting the shot was their only choice because they cannot afford to lose their jobs or education. They have held off as long as they could, but are not given any alternatives that are options for them and their families. This is the reason our hospitals are in crisis and staff are experiencing anxiety and burnout. The PTSD that healthcare workers are experiencing comes from the feeling that they are not able to give patients the quality of care that they should be getting, the fear that something is being missed, and the feeling of guilt if people die because of it. Firing hospital staff over this mandate is wrong and is only adding exponentially to this crisis. We are losing amazing Alaskan healthcare workers, most of which have already had and recovered from COVID and have natural immunity, not because we are wanting to leave, but because we are being forced to voluntarily resign or are actually being fired in a time where we absolutely cannot afford to lose nurses and other healthcare professionals. To provide any type of intervention in healthcare usually requires informed consent. Informed consent is making a personal decision regarding care, knowing all the risks and benefits before consent is granted. Many people receiving these mRNA or adenovirus-based injections do not understand that these are entirely different than a traditional vaccine. Therefore, informed consent is not actually being attained. Dr. Robert Malone, who is one of the researchers who created this mRNA technology, has even voiced significant concerns about the technology's use in these vaccines and is being silenced and removed from references of his involvement in the creation of this technology because of it. And he is one of the most qualified and educated individuals on this subject. Why is that happening? There are seven people in my family alone who are either losing their jobs or were forced to take the shot due to their specific circumstances. We are very concerned about how we're going to provide for our families. Certain family members are being told that they must receive an injection by next week, regardless of the fact that they had COVID and monoclonal antibodies recently. This can cause an even more severe reaction due to being already immunosuppressed from the virus. They were told that it does not matter and that they will be removed from their job by the deadline if they do not comply, period. Nursing students are being forced to take the shot or forfeit their education that they have worked so hard for. This prevents them from graduating and joining our already critically depleted workforce. 
Many of those who are forced to get it are paying a severe price with their well-being and are outraged at the discrimination that made them go against their individual rights and freedoms in taking the shot. I have been told by so many vaccinated people that I know personally that they are experiencing horrible reactions like autoimmune issues, nervous system changes like numbness and vision changes, horrible headaches, reproductive issues with significant menstruation changes, heart inflammation, difficulty breathing, organs that started to shut down requiring hospitalization and near death, very few of which have actually been reported to VAERS due to the difficulty in filing those reports. These concerns are real and should not be ignored. This is why each individual must be free from coercion to make the decision to accept or decline these shots according to their own risk-benefit analysis and medical history. Many of the COVID positive cases in the hospital are actually vaccinated individuals who can still spread it to others. The vast majority of people do very well with COVID and do not need a vaccine. So why is this being pushed like it is? Why are we not using all the other treatments that have shown to reduce severe COVID with little to no risk factors? We are violating HIPAA practices, foundational principles of biomedical ethics, and constitutional freedoms in mandating these injections. Alaskans have always taken pride in our state and the freedoms that we have always held. We must continue to protect those freedoms and our ability to make personal healthcare decisions free from discrimination, coercion, and hostility. I love being a nurse, and I just want to be able to continue to help others and provide compassionate, high-quality, and evidence-based care for my patients. Thank you very much for this opportunity to finally voice our concerns and for standing for the individual right to choose. Thank you, Molly. Um, Thank you. Before we go any further, I want to apologize to Mr. Weddleton. He's kind of in my blind view, but he's been here with us for hours, and I just want everybody to appreciate the fact that he did come down um, to join us on this. Sorry, John. I didn't mean to do that. Hello. My name is Ashley Bennett, and I am a student, and I do not support a COVID-19 vaccination mandate in any form. I'm a lifelong Alaskan and a 2022 University of Alaska Health Science pre-professional graduate. My role in this life is to help people, so to no surprise, a position serving in healthcare has always been my dream. After graduating, I started my first job in healthcare at Providence, where I worked as a medical scribe. My intention in this position was to gain work experience while learning from professionals, which I admire and aspire to be. I wanted to see medicine in action while I decided how I would further my own career. Would I apply to medical school or would I apply to nursing school? Unfortunately, I am now unsure if I will pursue either. My work experience at the hospital was short-lived. I ultimately made the decision to leave this position after a brief four months due to the immediate isolation, discrimination, and the blatant aggressive harassment that I witnessed as an unvaccinated employee. At the beginning of my employment, the mask policy was universal, so I blended in. Unknowing to others, I was deeply offended by very discriminating language I was surrounded by regarding the dangers of and selfishness of unvaccinated people, patients and colleagues alike. Every day, I followed physicians into exam rooms and witnessed patients clearly state that they, and I quote, were not comfortable with accepting this vaccine at this time. Regardless of their personal stance, patients were continually coerced and regularly pressured by medical providers to take the shot. Despite an undisputable lack of clinical data on the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine, specifically during pregnancy, I continued to witness pregnant women being regularly and aggressively pressured to get the shot. If a mother stated she was uncomfortable taking the shot during pregnancy, she would yet again be harassed at her next visit and the following and the following. To witness long-standing, well-respected providers neither recognizing nor practicing the basic morals regarded, regarding bodily autonomy, which I learned about in Meth Medical Ethics 101. This was disheartening to say the least. During my time in this position, the policies evolved. As a non-vaccinated employee, it became company policy that I was required to wear a mask at all times, while vaccinated employees were not. So it was inevitable that every employee of the office would quickly come to know of my, have knowledge of my own personal medical choices. But my story today is not about leaving or losing my job. My story is about being a prospective future healthcare provider in Alaska for Alaskans. I'm currently preparing 
or considering applying for the 2023 cohort in the University of Province Bachelor of Science in Nursing program, which requires all students to comply with Providence's COVID-19 vaccination policy. Almost done. Under this policy, due to my choices, if I do not take the shot, I will lose the opportunity to attend this program. This inhibits my ability to become a future provider in Alaska. The shortage of healthcare professionals in our hospitals will not only be an issue come October 18th, but for, I fear, generations to come. The mandate will continue to deter the next generation of Alaskans from pursuing potential careers in healthcare. If the institutions which educate our professionals will not recognize our own basic rights regarding bodily autonomy, then how can we be expected to advocate those rights for our patients? I'm not anti-vax, I'm not anti-mask. I am pro-choice, pro-one-size-does-not-fit-all. I am pro-free will, pro-bodily autonomy, and as American, I'm truly shocked that we are even coming to debate over our most basic human rights. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, thank you for um, listening. I'm Dr. Jennifer Lovedahl. Am I too close? Okay. I am a small business owner. I'm a chiropractor here in Anchorage, Alaska, and I've uh, owned my own business for over a decade now. Um, I have been seeing hundreds of patients each month um, since 2020, um, and I have not seen any cases spreading in my office. I am doing an extremely good job of cleaning my office, cleaning my hands, protecting my patients, and um, I feel the stress of uh, the vaccine mandates will even impact my office. What I have seen in my office is increased um, injuries from these vaccines. I have seen sciatica, I have seen um, nerve damage in the arms and legs, I have seen increase in migraines, I have seen um, blood clots. I've seen a woman with a blood clot get on a plane to go travel to see her family and lots of Alaskans travel out of state. Her doctors did not warn her to get on a plane after her blood clot. Um, I'm very concerned for Alaskans. I'm very concerned for my community. Um, this vaccine, how can we, um, you know, pick up and clean up the um, damage when we don't know much about it and how to reverse these effects. They're coming to chiropractors for musculoskeletal pain and neurologic pain, but um, you know, how much more of this am I going to have to see if these mandates keep coming? I'm very concerned about that. I'm concerned about the long-term effects when um, women are forced to vaccinate and uh, their children, um, we don't know the effects of the next generation and the next generation. Um, sorry, I'm very nervous. <laughs> um, and uh, I've lost track, but um, I, I also know that I have had patients come in that are extremely under so much stress and pressure, and that's causing um, a lot of headaches tension in their body, back pain, neck pain. So I feel like I'm going to continue to see more and more of this, and I don't think that's healthy for our community. I think that the shortage of, um, obviously, of staffing is going to be a concern um, for our economy here, and um, I don't think this mandate should um, be forced upon us. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Uh, my name, I don't think is really relevant. It's the content of the Sir, can you please just come up to the mic? Well, I'd really rather, I'd rather make my case first by mic with all due respect. Well, I want you to respect the rest of the community. Come on, so we can, we can all hear you.
three minutes is not going to work, all right? It used to be five to seven minutes. People used to come down here and, and argument their errors, their gripes. There was never a problem. Now, now, what I'm trying to do is to make the case here in front of you by standing over here so you can see the merits of my request. I'm not here to be adversarial, but I'm damn well used to those moments. I'm here to support you, okay? Now, because she challenged you, what happens is that disrupts you. Like the three minutes when they shut you off with the microphone. And let me tell you this, you ever run for school board? You better never tell me you have experience. That's the last person I ever want to sit on a school board. But the point is this, they shut us down. All they put is our back of our heads to these people, which means we can't gauge the intensity of our discontent, whether it's to them or to us. Now, I'll go to the microphone out of respect to you, Ms. Allard, and the mayor especially, and the other particles here. But ladies and gentlemen, we need a, a, two more points if I might first go sit down. You try to gather a group up. I've been many places, I've been, in, in, I've been hunted and everything else about public forums. There's no place to gather. All these groups are trying to gather. They can't gather. There's no public service announcement. They're meeting in their homes. They're moving to other places because that damn Marston Theater, they hog the damn thing. They shut us down here. They don't give a crap about us. We need to breach the society. What we're witnessing now, the assault on our individual freedoms, which is what this is, it's a presumption of guilt before innocence. It violates the very basic laws. I don't care where you're at or who we are. They're shutting us down, and this mayor has a chance to evolve us where we should be. So now, hold that thought for one more point that I'll go to very quick. You need a public service announcement. I expected to hold up bands in support of the nurse over on the streets over there. I had no clue this meeting was going on. And we do, they do this to us, hold on, they do this to us across the board, the state, the school board, every damn place we go, they do this. The mayor needs to demand in some way Every damn media, I don't care who it is, Rush, I don't care who, what show it is, what radio show, what newspaper, you need to give us a public service announcement so that we can see one another. That's so I can right. come down and argue with you and, and challenge you and point, point deep like you just did me a moment ago. These people continue, I'm going to say just a second, these people, not these people, but, but what we structure the society, these people lose it. They've lost the mission, they've lost a sense of priority, they've lost a sense of purpose, they shut us down. They do not want our input, and many of these subjects are so complex and overwhelming, they can't possibly handle them. But they don't want to sit on our asses here all night. So when you, what is this? Is this true? So let me, I just want to make something perfectly clear to every, thank you, thank you. Let me just make something clear to everybody here. Today was a listening session. This is not. Um, anything but inviting the public by word of mouth. This is not an official assembly meeting. This is a listening session. So I absolutely appreciate everybody being here and coming down on a Saturday afternoon. This is not an official meeting. Just a second. This is now. This this is I, you know, this is what I'm talking about. Why would you have the police come everywhere we go now? We're seeing private security guards in public property. They're threatening us. Sir, can I speak for just a second? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You, so you you've spoken and everybody stop. Everybody stop. Yeah, yeah. I'm stop. used to peanut calls. Just hold on. Stop. This is not an assembly meeting. This is not an official meeting. This is something that we just said we want to hear the public. Right. Nobody is doing anything but courtesy with the three meals. Right, that's minutes. why I came here. But now you're 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 kind of coming. So now in. you're going to first you shame me because you give three minutes. This is this this is this is the inconsistency, no. the contradictions, the hypocrisy. Then you threaten me with police. Mr. Kendall, you're Simply. being rude to everybody who waited in line and waited their yeah, turn. I, I, lo I love that. You shame me because you yes. people don't serve us. Yes. Well, that's that's what you're I thought. How twisted it's all become. And, you're being rude. and then you're women on top of it. Now I'm going I'm to leave. Yeah, I, I, I'm part of this group. Just so everybody knows, I didn't call the police, okay? Yeah, I, I am, yeah. So let's, I'm, let's, I'm going to do that. So let's, that was Mr. I don't need a brotherhood. I don't need a law. We're going to do it, I'm, right? I'm Gentlemen, I'm used to 20 place. minutes, okay? I'd, please, sir. I've been other places besides this. But thank you, for, thank you, Mayor, for what you for this meeting here, okay? Okay. We are ready to roll forward. You ready? I'm going to put the clock on for three minutes. Okay. Hopefully I'll be done before that. My name is Casey Lewis, and I'm a free United States citizen. I heard a quote in my early 20s, for evil to prevail, all it takes is a for good man to do nothing. <clears throat> I do my best now to remember this, and that is why I'm here. I used to call people sheep that wore the mask. I realized that I was being just as bad as those who were staring at me as if I was a villain for not wearing one. <clears throat> 
So one thing we need to remember that we can make and have our own opinion, and those that want the vaccine and wear a mask can make and have their own opinion, and that's okay. So I have a short message. How do you cook a frog? You put a lid on the pot so it doesn't jump out, which is metaphorical for how the media is guided and blocking anything that which isn't mainstream. Then you slowly bring the water temperature higher and higher until they're cooked, which I equate to these mandates. Mass, mass, mass. People got angry that he went up too fast, so us, the people, fought to get the mandates relieved, and they did. The water temperature went down, but then we were so tired of the mass, we were happy when the water got hotter again with vaccines. <clears throat> and now it's even getting hotter. I'm here for one of the many COVID-19 issues, should employers be able to mandate the vaccine? I'm against it. As I learned in my business law class, law is based on precedence, and if the precedence is allowing employers to choose your own personal health care, where does it end? If they can force me to get the vaccine, a personal medical decision, or get fired, what is that to stop them from requiring women or men to be on birth control or any other unknown future medical health concerns? Secondly, as a father, <clears throat> my child at the age of 14 could go and get an abortion without telling me. So what sense as an adult does it make that an employer can make my own medical decision for me? Lastly, the people, politicians, and now employers that are requiring the vaccine mandates are more than able to go without a job for more than six months to possibly the rest of their life. But the people that, are trying, that they are trying to force to get the vaccine are worried about each week of having enough money for rent, fuel, utility bills, and of course food to feed and then shelter their families. It's a fear tactic, and that is not how we should be led. Logically, if you can get COVID without the vaccine and you can get COVID after you've had the vaccine, why is it mandated? Why do you need to get the vaccination? <clears throat> Vaccines and masks should be a personal decision, not one for the government or employers. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Smith, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tammy Smith, and I'd rather not say where I work. Um, I'm here and I want to just lay out some questions here. I implore you to question why the Biden administration and other politicians and others are pushing so hard for everyone to take the jab. Why the White House, the CDC, the FDA, Pfizer, Moderna, and the executive branch are not required to take the jab. You should be questioning why states and employers are giving money and dangling carrots, other carrots, to take the jab. Why they are ignoring the real science. Why are they not allowing proven treatments to be used? Why now the Biden administration is now starting to limit the monoclonal antibody treatment? Why some providers don't offer any treatment at all to their patients and they tell their patients to go home? That there's nothing that they can do for them. I know someone personally right now, her whole family had COVID. Her son is 15 years old, lost his hearing, still fighting COVID, and they've been turned, around, turned away several times with no treatment. They threaten providers with taking their licenses and losing their jobs because it goes against the narrative. Yes, this is a horrible virus, but this is not about the virus. It's about fear mongering and dividing us into two camps, just like Nazi Germany. I'm sorry to say that, but that's the truth. This is how they start taking our freedoms and our liberties away. It's about suppression and censorship. And as many others have already said, my body, my choice. And I will leave you with this. President Truman said, once a government is committed to the principle of silencing the voice of opposition, it has only one way to go, and that is down the path of increasingly repressive measures until it becomes a source of terror to all citizens and creates a country where everyone lives in fear. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I want to thank you guys for calling this today. I did listen to the assembly meeting, and I'm glad that you offered an opportunity for more people to speak. And I thank everyone for coming and offering their side of um, kind of uh, the reflection of the story. Um, I'm going to start with saying that 
President Biden made that announcement, but in June he stopped OSHA from reporting any adverse reactions in work sites. So he's prepping the situation to ensure that we do not know what's happening with this vaccine. On top of that, we have VAERS, which is 1 to 10 percent of the reporting, and many doctors have not even heard of it, yet it's a federal regulation that they report on those based on the um, emergency use authorization. So there was no pre-teaching of any hospital setting or doctor to provide all that information into VAERS. And what we're finding is more and more nurses are coming forward and doctors are coming forward saying that this is not something that they've even heard of or doing. So the one to 10% is now 14,500 people as of yesterday. And that's probably three weeks ago because they don't update it every single day. It is a vetted system. It is a system that um, will look at the information and call the doctor back. It is not uh, bogus. And if you look it up in mainstream media, it's debunked. And it is a site run by CDC and FDA jointly. And it's been in, uh, in, uh, in the works for decades. And we are now twice the amount of deaths from this vaccine than any other vaccine we've ever used in our lifetime that we have recorded in that system. We stopped the swine flu vaccine with 25 deaths, and we are continuing on with this with 14,500. Um, please look up Peter, um, uh, Pierre Corey. He testified in front of the Senate in December. You probably have to do a duck, duck, go search to find it. You may not find it on uh, Google, but he talked about ivermectin. They used ivermectin on 800 prophylactic uh, doctors in South America, and 800 of them were COVID free in the COVID unit. The control group had about 56% with COVID out of the 400 that did not get ivermectin. It is used for pretreatment, it is used for early treatment, and it's not as great, but can be used for later treatment. That is being completely suppressed everywhere you look. It's a paste for a, a horse, and it won the Nobel Prize. It won the Nobel Prize because they considered it almost a miracle drug for the amount of things it helped, the amount of viruses that it could um, wipe out. And it probably wipes out the flu, and that might be a reason why they don't want us to know about it, because they want you to get that flu vaccine, too. Um, yeah, it's, it's really all about money, and this is what scares me about this. We have censorship. You can't get information out. I'm on Nextdoor. I got off of Facebook. Nextdoor just censored me with talking about VAERS, so that's where you go with it. I'm totally against all of the um, max vaccine mandates. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Ryan Dahovsky. I own Whole Family Chiropractic and Whole Family Integrated Wellness with my wife, Dr. Jessica. For the last 10 years, we've made it our purpose to assist families, community members, and patients in this community to achieve health, healing, and hope through the most advanced methods necessary with structural, functional, and regenerative medicine. We've been fortunate enough to, to, to treat these patients who are minutes old to some who have been left for, some who have days left for a host of diseases, conditions, and complaints. Our office regularly accommodates 400 to 450 patients per week, the majority of who are under my care with direct contact, direction, intervention, even through the pandemic. I make sure my patients know that I'm here for them, whether holidays, weekends, anniversaries, it's irrelevant. I will always do what I can for that person whenever I can, however I can, when needed. I'll also, I'm also often known as a provider who's more skilled with my hands than my words. However, today my purpose is to adjust minds, not spines. So my voice will have to suffice. As you can see, I may be small in stature, but I'm big on service and ideals, none of which is more important to me than the fact that every single person should be allowed autonomy in their health care decisions. Health is a personal responsibility that allows us, the individual, to be entitled to all of the consequences of their, their decisions, good and bad. I stand here in support and solidarity with those around me who are being shamed, shame bullied, and feeling alone <clears throat> to protect that which is most sovereign to provide a voice of caution, a voice of dissent, and a voice of resistance to an injustice that is taking over and sweeping a nation that is captivated, captivated by fear and avoiding logical discourse as a result. I'm not here to debate the merits of all vaccines or the current vaccine, for which there is little proven efficacy without collateral damage, whether immediately visible or not. The Supreme Court acknowledged the fact that this is the case and ruled that all vaccines are unavoidably unsafe, all of them. 
To claim that the safety and efficacy is unquestionable and undeniable is to subject oneself to an understanding of the procedure that makes it analogous to religious dogma. To imply that people from all walks of life who are even slightly cautious or completely anti-mandate or pro-medical choice are delusional or have grandiose stories of injury or are simply fearful of needles is a blatant display of ego, narcissism, and ignorance that fuels further division, utilizing the tactics of shame under the umbrella of the if you are not with us, you are against us mentality. There is legitimacy to more claims of vaccine injury than not. The whole system nearly fell in 1986 when Pre President Reagan had to sign the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, relieving the pharmaceutical companies of responsibility for their product because they pleaded with him to do so or they would have been irreparably injured from the financial losses associated with the plethora of tort lawsuits for vaccine injury at the time. This is truth in the history of vaccines. This currently is not a tested medical intervention with long-term safety studies. This is not an intervention that is void of harm, permanent injury, and even death. VAERS data from the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System suggests over 14,000 deaths, as was previously said, and thousands of injuries as a result of current inoculation practices. These injuries have impacted every single part of the body and include various skin reactions, gut and digestive system reactions, neurological complications, musculoskeletal inflammation, reproductive health. I've also chosen to be here today to speak for those who cannot or, hear not, or are not choose to be here. I've treated frontline workers as a frontline worker. I've seen the stress and their struggle. I'm almost done, please. I've seen them leave the fire burn to come back for more. I've seen them cry for others and themselves. I see them abandoned, expendable. I see them being discarded instead of applauded. I speak for those who have served our country, those who have impeccable records, who were sent to foreign lands from their families, and who face dishonorable discharge over a mandated medical procedure lacking uh, specific safety studies. Again, almost done. I speak for those who have cared for patients to the point where they have sacrificed themselves. They give hugs when no one else could. They sang songs of hope when, th when the silence of isolation was deafening. They pushed others in gurneys to the point where they couldn't push anymore. They'd all come to us with their concerns, their conditions to be reported, repaired, and they would repeat the cycle over and over again. I speak for my team as their leader who will not comply with mandates, who will educate and empower with the principles of health and healing with the compassion that even if they don't pursue them, I will respect their decision to do so. I speak for my children. <clears throat> what doesn't stop me continues with them. They will know I did for them what was necessary to protect the underlying fact that their bodies are their own. And lastly, I'd like to share just this few thoughts and concerns and perspectives with a story. A traveler was wandering in the desert towards a city that could be seen in the distance. Anticipating some respite from his journey, he was approached from behind quickly by two figures heading the same way. He greeted them and asked where they were headed. To the city over there, one replied. Being polite and making small talk, the man asked what business they had going to that destination. He said, to know that, you will have to know who we are, replied the figure. I am plague, and over here is my friend, fear, and we're going to go to that city to kill 100,000 people. The traveler was shocked initially but suddenly became very curious. He looked up and asked Plague if he was going to do all that work himself. Plague smiled and said, no, I'll only take care of a few hundred. I'll let my fear, friend Fear do the rest. Everyone here needs to be reminded our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us the most. I will raise my voice to reiterate that I will not comply. Coronavirus has become the new religion of a divided government, and I will not force any of those I care for, any of those I employ, or any of those that I love into an incentivized course or forced baptism through inoculation. I choose to oppose this mandate. I choose to be a light. Sir, thank you for your testimony. That was, thank you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Jessica Dahovsky. I own also Whole Family Chiropractic with my husband, Dr. Ryan, who just spoke. And to follow him is ridiculous, so I'm just going to do this. <laughs> I am a pediatric and pregnancy chiropractor. I speak and I teach other doctors around the world about pediatrics and pregnancy. This is a population that is underserved. Um, it's particularly um, typically steered away from when it comes to things like um, these, uh, these medicines, these vaccinations, et cetera. I see plenty of immunocompromised children. I see pa patients who have had injury um, or come to this earth with things that are not from, uh, the parents would choose that to have heart transplants, immunocompromisation, cancer. I speak because I believe that these children deserve um, to live in a world that offers them the freedom to choose what they need to have for their bodies to be able to heal themselves and that medicine is not one size fits all. We saw over 18,000 patient visits between March 2020 and March 2021. 18,000 patients. We did uh, so many, we did so much care. We, we were careful with our, uh, uh, we 
cleaning and all the things that we did, and not one time did we have to contact Trace. We made sure that everybody was safe, happy, healthy, and receiving lifetime and lifestyle education. That is a huge component of something that is missing from healthcare. We need to teach lifestyle because there are so many components of not just coronavirus, but so many other viruses that are absolutely preventable and diminish um, high risk, um, th things like that. Um, we have seen patients feeling ostracized. We've seen them uh, feeling fired by their primary medical providers. We've had them come in, um, tears asking if they can even come in if they are expressing any sort of symptoms. We are doctors. We are here to take care of patients who are sick, who are ill, who are, it doesn't matter what that is. We have been open in the mornings, in the afternoons, and in the nighttime to take care of our COVID positive patients, to do all the things that we need to do for them, to take care of our COVID negative patients in the time there. Um, each patient deserves to have an opportunity to have uh, their medical choices kept free. Our children go to private school. There's still no medical choice given uh, whether they still have to mask. That is not medical freedom. I ask that we are transforming our generations of our children into something that's evolving instead of devolving. Continue to keep medical freedom free. This is America, and thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. My name is Angela Sherman, and I am a special education teacher here in Anchorage. Um, I have taught for 18 years, and this is my third year here. I am not an anti-vaxxer or an anti-masker. I do believe that these medical choices should just be that. They are medical choices, and not. I don't think they should be mandated. In November 2020, I caught the COVID virus, and my husband did as well. Having an underlying health condition of asthma and upper and lower respiratory challenges, I knew the great risk of contracting COVID. I had four days spent at home with my sick husband taking care of me. We took vitamins, checked our temperatures, uh, and checked oxygen levels. I took my asthma meds, and I even needed to take my nebulizer, which did very little to help with breathing for myself. Um, on day four, my husband needed to call the EMTs, and I was taken to the ER and admitted to the hospital for six days. My main form of daily treatment in the hospital was oxygen, taking steroid inhalers, uh, remdesivir, IV infusions, and receiving convalescent plasma. On the sixth day, um, I was able to come home very happy, but I was very changed. Um, I won't go into the great details, but I don't know whether it was COVID or taking remdesivir, but it, it truly changed changed me physically and mentally. Um, going back to work in person with students, it was great. I did have some anxiety, not because of possibly catching COVID again, but just after effects of having COVID. Um, seeing the kids was probably the best thing, except for, of course, seeing their faces. It's been kind of sad not seeing their smiles. Um, I was disheartened when we were asked as a whole staff of the district whether we were vaxxed, unvaxxed, or we had the choice of saying um, that we didn't have to respond. However, I did talk with some other district employees and they said that they, when they said they were undecided either way, whether they're vaxxed or unvaxxed, that they were being told that they were unvaxxed. So, that was kind of disheartening just to be assumed that we were unvaxxed when we chose not to say that we were either way. Um, my job is not on the line as of yet, but I have been thinking about it, not like the healthcare workers. Um, my great concern is that later on, this vax will be mandated for children to go to school. And that's what's really frightening for me, that it'll be considered something that will have to be taken like you know, a booster or something like that. So I believe in my body, my choice. Parents have that ch ultimate choice for their children, and that's what I believe. All right. Hello, my name's Becky Baldoff. I don't have a prepared speech, but I'll just tell my story. I've been a nurse for 40 years. I've worked at Providence for 31 years. 
and I'm choosing not to be injected with the toxin and so I'm going to be forced to retire. I wanted to work. I love my job. I wanted to work till I was 72 and I'm not even going to get to 60. So I'm just really sad and I think it's a hypocrisy that it's known that this um, virus affects the metabolically unhealthy people. I've been working very hard on my metabolism, my immune health for the last three years. They're demanding we get the shot, but yeah, you go in the break room and they're giving us pizza, candy, cookies, donuts. Happy Nurses Day, happy NICU neonatal nurses week. Here's your donuts. Viruses feed on sugar and this virus affects the metabolically unhealthy. So what is the message they're sending us? Um, I also just wanted to anecdotally talk about, um, I have a friend that works on the slope. He's not vaccinated. All the unvaccinated people have to get tested before they go up at the airport. And the unvaccinated people don't have to get tested. There is COVID on the slope, according to his testament. And so it's got to be coming from the vaccinated people because they're not being tested. They know going up, all the unvaccinated people are negative. So thank you very much for having this today. Hi, my name is Darlene Fox. I work for ANTHC. I submitted my um, religious exemption and didn't hear nothing back. So this is what I'm gonna read here today. To whom it may concern, my name is Darlene Fox and I have a total of approximately 10 years of dedicated time and effort as a hardworking employee of ANTHC, promoting its vision of Alaskans being the healthiest people in the world. I am writing to you to inform you of my religious exemption from the COVID-19 vaccination as I have been informed that I will need to sign a voluntary resignation or get the vaccine. The entire organization has taken this vision and believe the wholeheartedly that we as Alaska Natives, through the aid of this highly accredited medical establishment, will not only protect but encourage truth and godly morals leading to the protection of our people's rights, choices, and beliefs. In fact, this vision is why many of us work for this establish, establishment as we want to help make Alaska Natives the health, healthiest people in the world. Sadly, I believe this vision is being hijacked by the, this current political administration's choice to force or mandate a vaccination that does not warrant forced vaccinations as this virus is 99% curable through not only one form of medication, but a few others such as hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, ivermectin, zinc, etc. Instead of fighting for the truth behind these first vac vaccines under the cover of proper health care and the right thing to do for humanity's sake, ANTHC is in agreement with the federal government via Indian Health Service. They are, no, <clears throat> they are going against their own code of ethics to push vaccine that is not only proven to carry side effects and even death. It, it gets me thinking what's really behind the push to vaccinate not only those who rightfully choose not to take the vaccine, but to choose who, who have had positive COVID-19 results already, who by all scientific proof that when one carries the virus, antibodies are naturally produced and proven to be um, 13 times more effective. It, that's wrong. It's 37 times more effective than the vaccine. We are real. Are we really working towards the safety of the native people or are we politically are are we a political tool for the leftist plan to indoctrinate leftist Marxist ways that lead directly to ushering communi communism that we Alaskans have fought and died for is our natural born right and God given right to choose that we put under informed consent into our bodies. I know and you know there is something morally and ethically wrong when we, an entity has to force their employees to vaccinate themselves with something that has proven not to be 100% effective in preventing COVID-19 and its variants. And most of all, it's morally and ethically wrong to make someone choose between putting something into their bodies that is toxic and the decision to end a person's livelihood over something proven totally ineffective and 99% curable. 
The long-term effects have not even been proven yet, nor has the time to see when these side effects will do over a period of time. It has already been proven that more and more booster shots are needed to keep the vaccine somewhat effective in, in, in its fight against the COVID virus and its variants. How many more boosters will be needed to combat the variants that keep replicating? It is just a medical experiment, just as experiments that were done under the Nazi regime during the Nuremberg trials, where Jews were forcibly used as human guinea pigs, in which these trials were deemed unethical, immoral, and most of all, the biggest crime against humanity. To my observation and opinion, these forced vac vaccines are COVID for COVID-19 are just the same, nothing more, nothing less. This puts, this lets me put in, in a way that ANTHC is the oppressor and the unvaccinated are the persecuted. For those of us who believe wholeheartedly in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God Almighty himself have the God-given right to protect anything that goes, <clears throat> object to anything that goes against our religious belief, not only for personal reasons, but it is our constitutional right. Our rights are being violated and abused by government, governmental entities and this current political administration without any obligation for the safety and protection of all God's children. I ask that you take into consideration my request for relig religious exemption. I believe everyone's body is a temple for the Holy Spirit and I hold a strong belief that the COVID-19 vaccine violates my Christian views. Religious freedom is not only my right, but everyone's right, and no government should force unknown substances into our bodies as our temples are clean. This goes against my belief to have a harmful ingredient, ingredients injected into my body. First Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 states, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own for you, but you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. As, as I am not refusing the COVID-19 vaccine, I am deferring until further testing is done and extensive safety data is analyzed and available to provide inform, informed consent. Um, will ANTHC take full responsibility and sign a letter that they will take full responsibility for, my, for any and all side effects, including death? if I am to take this vaccine in order to stay employed. Ma'am, can you wrap it up for it? Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, if you can hold on just a minute. He, go ahead, uh, Brittany, go ahead and get him on the line. The slope worker. <laughs> Hello, this is Sam. Hey, Sam. This is Jamie Allard, an assembly member, uh, Weddleton, and the mayor, Bronson. And we are down here listening to some testimony. Could you, um, in a listening session, can you go ahead and tell us what you're, you're seeing up on the slope and your views, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple months ago, uh, the company that I work for said that they were going to mandate vaccines and that you had to be vaccinated by the middle of October. Um, so since then, there, I've seen multiple people quit preemptively because they don't want to get the shot. And the company is going to, as far as I understand, is going to lose between 20 and 30 employees in total. Uh, they did allow for religious and medical exemptions to be submitted. I put my religious exemption in, but all of them were, they, they accepted the religious or medical exemption, but then claimed that it would cause undue hardship on the company, so it didn't work anyways. Um, in the past two months, I know of five employees of the company that have been sent home early for testing positive for the virus at work, and they were all vaccinated. Everybody that's been sent home has been vaccinated. Um, I'm not a doctor, and you have doctors and nurses that I understand you're talking to today, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I just want to mention that mandating these shots is a clear violation of the Nuremberg Code from 1947, 
And if you don't know what that is, you should look up the Nuremberg Code. The fact is that these are experimental gene therapy medications being forced upon us by companies and government against our will. And if you don't believe it's an experimental medication, then try to find the animal studies or the phase three human trials, which take three to five years to complete, because they don't exist. I believe everyone who wants the shot should be able to go get the shot, and anyone who doesn't want it should not be coerced into it. The whole situation is unreal, surreal, and illegal. Um, not sure what else you want to hear, I think. Uh, yeah. So I'm seeing a lot of people leaving, a lot of people being forced into getting the shots, and a lot of people losing their jobs over it, including myself. Sir, Sam, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Um, those that are traveling up to the slope, is it individuals who have taken the shot and, um, and also those who have not been tested for COVID before they fly? No, that's... Uh, so, uh, pretty much everyone that I know about who lives in the lower 48 has already gotten the vaccine on their own just specifically to make it easier to fly. But anyone who's not vaccinated, who comes to work, has to get tested in Anchorage before we can fly up. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for your testimony. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, ma'am, you're next. Hi, I'm Veronica Lambertson from Bird Creek, Alaska. I was detoured here from hosting a rally this morning. And um, the rally is for freedom. And I guess I'm going to thank you for inviting us to come here and testify. But I did hear a lot of professionals testify, and I have very patient children and family here waiting to go home from hours of testimony. Um, we're a family-run business. This hasn't affected us personally, but it's affected a lot of our families, friends, and we've seen businesses close down because of mandates. And my obs our observation, my husband and I are a team. <laughs> so our observations were at the beginning of this was that if you didn't do common sense hygiene, you were in trouble. And we've always done common sense hygiene. We've ran our business that way. We started with a cafe and now we have a motel. But personally for our family, which is the bigger priority is every parent is a first responder to health care. They are the first responders. So when the health care professionals were in here on the assembly meeting on Tuesday, I had a bigger question for all health care providers. When we're going to the hospital, what is their required treatment for when someone comes in? Because as a friend, I'm concerned because I'm hearing people that aren't being treated for the symptoms they have. They're being treated as though they have COVID, but they're not researching their health care symptoms. Is that all? Thank you, ma'am. State your name and your profession, please. Uh, my name is Jamie Moshella. Uh, I tried to write you an email and it didn't go through, so I decided to come down here and. I think you sent me a message on yeah. Messenger. I'm sorry, I just, it's been a week. That's <laughs> I'm, okay. I apologize. I have a little voice, but I still have a voice, so thank I you, decided to just come and speak. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for working to keep freedom of choice a part of our community. I am in no way against vaccinations, as my family and I have most recommended vaccines. My husband is the sole provider for our family, 
and works for a native corporation. Due to his refusal to get the vaccine, he is forced into quarantine when he travels. This means he's only home with his family for five days out of less than a month. <clears throat> this is not quality of life. I have a hard time with the vaccine for COVID-19, mRNA formula, and lack of research putting into making this safe enough. My son was born with an incurable pediatric liver disease. He's three now. <clears throat> the only cure is not a cure. It's a treatment. <clears throat> for biliary atresia, an eventual liver transplant is needed. My husband is a blood match, and I would hope to be a secondary candidate if my husband is unable to be a living donor for my son. It is my worry that the vaccine would hinder providing the healthiest organ possible for my son. The COVID-19 vaccination might be completely fine, but what if it's not? And what if is not an option? Due to staffing issues, I believe that we are not receiving optimal care. We're due to go down to Seattle Children's once a year, and due to staffing, that is now stretched out to a year and a half. That's not optimal care. We want more research and more time on this drug to ensure its safety before we decide on what's best for our family. Could you imagine a pediatric patient rejecting a life-saving organ due to donor's vaccine injury? Because I don't. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, my name is Kira Lewis. I'm a hairdresser here in Alaska, but first I'm a fifth generation, lifelong Alaskan, and a mother of four children in the Anchorage School District. And I have been devastated by the last 18 months year of what I've seen go on during this pandemic. <clears throat> in 2020, my husband and I became sick with COVID-19. We had six children living in our house. Four of mine and my sister had traveled to Seattle uh, for a, a kidney transplant for um, her husband and was her only care provider. During that time, me and my husband got COVID-19. We also went many places before we found out that we were sick because back then, if you remember, you were sick weeks before you even were diagnosed or whatever. And we didn't know that we were sick. So none of the kids, all the kids got tested, not one of them got COVID-19. Not one of them came down with any symptoms. Our youngest was nine months old. The next one was two. The next one was four. The next one was five. The next one was 10. And the next one was 11. None of them got sick. This year, my children have been experiencing going to the school district wearing a mask every single day. My children loved school. They have always loved school. And for the last two years of my older children's lives, they have been dealing with depression, anxiety, fear. They're not allowed to hug their friends. They're not allowed to go up to them and say something to them. They have to put something over their face. This much of their face is covered. My kindergartner who started school this year, when all of this went down, I had a kindergartner. So she came home and I taught her. That's fine. We can teach people how to read, right? It's not hard. Ask any teacher. It's impossible. It's really hard. And then at the same time, I'm teaching all of my other children and dealing with normal things that you think that as a mom, you don't, you don't think about the things that you have to experience as a child. Now we're dealing with all of our children. My oldest is 13, so she's allowed to get the vaccine. And every single week, I am getting emails from the school, from the Anchorage School District, about vaccination and how it's the best choice for them. My second grader is telling me, Mommy, I have to wear a mask while I run inside. My kindergarten son hates school 
And not because he has to read, but because he doesn't even know if people like him because they can't smile at him. This is not acceptable. My husband as well has been a US military member for the last 16 years, and now he is losing his job because he will not get the vaccine. This is not an okay thing. And all of our nurse workers, all of our health professionals that are working at our hospitals who have helped us for the last two years, we cannot let them just lose their jobs. I don't know how to stand up except for using my voice. So that's what I'm here to do today. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak. Um, I'm usually long-winded, but I'll keep this short, as Dave knows. Um, my name is Victor Knott, a lifelong Alaskan, been here 56 years. Uh, last year, I came down with the COVID virus, went through the process, kept myself at home. I'm fairly healthy, made it through with no problems. Now I have my natural immune system that's protecting me. Uh, now I've done research and found out that if I were to go and get the any kind of vaccine that there's a good possibility that I could wind up in a hospital. I have never been in a hospital my whole entire life and now getting a vaccine could put me there. On another note, my wife is on her last year as a nurse in the nursing program at UAA. She is rather concerned because she is now being approached and coerced into taking a vaccine that she has as going through the nursing program, understands that there are possibilities that there could be something that would happen. She could end up being permanently disabled. I could be her caregiver instead of maybe being the other way around, which I had planned. But <laughs> the roles could be reversed. So she's concerned. She is an upcoming caregiver or professional in the, hospital, in the medical profession. And it would be very sad to see her stop her program and opt out. And that's all I have to say. We're going to be losing a lot of professionals in these kind of fields. And it's going to be sad because, again, all of us are going to need them eventually. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nellie Hanasak, and um, I was here to support my sister, and um, I decided I thought I'd kind of come and say something, because I recently had COVID, and um, once I was told I had COVID, I asked the ANMC Valley Clinic what options I had in regards to maybe hydrochloroquine, maybe the z pack different options that would be able to help me and my son. Um, and unfortunately, we were told no. No. I said, okay, well, I know you've given my son the z pack before because he had pneumonia at one time. Um, do you think that we can get just the z pack And we were told no when there's so many people that are dying in our hospitals right now that are sick and their family has no hope, why are the medical field personnel not doing everything they can to try to save these people? It's like that gal up there who did hydrochloroquine in the z pack and was able to pull out of it. Why can't they just try, try to give them this medication? It doesn't matter what they may have. Think about it. If a family member requests any type of alternative medicine that they think that might save their family member, why are we being told no? 
Is it because it's IHS? Is it because Jill Biden was here touring ANTHC? Got to stop and think about people's death and what trauma it brings to everybody and just try it. Why isn't people given the option instead of being told no? It was a scary time for me, and I'm really glad that I had a lot of support. I was able to find ivermectin, um, but I shouldn't have had to look and look and look. I was given a prescription for ivermectin, and there's seven facilities that declined it. And then I finally found one that would distribute it, plus the z -Pack. In my opinion, the z -Pack just itself helped with the um, chest irritation, um, even just the z -Pack. But to be denied it, outright denied, because they said, we just, you, we just won't give it to you right now. So, you know, they post the number of deaths that are on the TV every night. Why don't we just kind of post your options for facilities that will be able to help you if you wanted to? And then we can start comparing the number of people who are surviving, right? Thank you for listening. Thank you, ma'am. So we have one person coming up to the podium, so if there's anybody else, let's everybody step forward if you want to testify. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, my name is Kelly Trahan. Closer, there. My name is Kelly Trahan. I'm a nurse at Providence in the OR. I've been nursing for 36 years. Um, my experience has been seven years ICU, two years employee health, and the rest in the OR and I probably will lose my job over this vaccine. I've seen a lot of changes in the healthcare profession over my years of nursing. And the trend has been, we are very much controlled by our government, by insurance agencies, dictating how we care for our patient. That is so far from where we've begun in the medical, well, where I have begun in the medical profession. And so the answer to this lady's question about why can't we get the care is because it's being dictated and it's not being given by our critical thinkers. And I think what's important for us to understand is that all of the critical thinkers are losing their jobs. Yeah. And so you people, when you go for medical care, when I'm gonna have to go for medical care, you're going to be receiving care from a robot because your critical thinkers are being fired. Think about that, people. You're not going to get the best medical care because it's being dictated by an insurance company or a government agency or some other entity. So just keep that in mind. The other thing um, I want people to understand is, I'm a Christian. I respect whatever you are. I have a God that can control who I am, but he gives me a free will to make a choice. I will not stand for a government that's going to tell me what I need to put in my body and what I can't. And I don't think any of us should. If my God is going to give me a free will, I will not succumb to a government that's not going to give me a freedom of choice. Where we've had soldiers die, we've had people lose their family members for many, many years to give us that freedom. And I think it's time for us to stand up as Americans and fight to keep that freedom. Thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it, and I wish you all the best. God bless you. Right on. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hi there. Um, my name is Wendy Bowens, and I was not planning on talking. Wendy, do you mind if you can? Are you in the medical field? or No. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm retired. A little young, but I am retired. Um, so since I am retired, I have plenty of time to research what the heck has been going on for the last year and a half. And all I see is government overreach everywhere. And this is insane. And I want to touch on what other people have said about the hospitals. They are not treating our, our patients. I, I'm not in the medical field, but I have listened to a bunch of doctors talking about this. And I know the ones up here are not prescribing ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, or I can't say it. Um, and those are proven to help. Why can't patients have that? Instead, they're doing the CDC protocol, which puts them on remdesivir, which shuts down their damn kidneys, and they're pumping them full of fluid, and their lungs start filling up. And then they inter in intubate them, and My uncle is in the hospital right now, and this is what they are doing to him. And I'm sorry, but this is murder. Yes, it is. And I, didn't, I wasn't going to talk, but I found out when I went outside to take a, a, a five-minute break. I called my husband, and he, he told me this news. And this has got to stop. This has to stop. Hello, my name is Eric Lambertson. I've been here 26 years. I have my wife and my children. I have six children here in Alaska. They've all been born here. I'm raising them here. I'm very proud of everybody that has testified here today. It's a groundswell of support for those that are taking a stand against government overreach from the highest level. And I think that you here, who have taken the position, that have been elected to your position, are taking a very big stand. And I, I hope that you understand. I hope that you understand the headwinds that you are up against, that this is something that is being pushed at the highest level, beyond the President of the United States. You're talking about corporate money interests that are coming for you, that have been coming for you. So what you're up against is big. But you also have to understand also that we, the consent of the governed, are behind you we consent to be governed. And when we remove our consent, that's when you, you, need to be worried. Because it goes in a very different direction. And I pray that that never happens, but it's happened before. And you have a very educated people behind me. There's a groundswell here. And you better listen to it. Because I have a number of people that I am talking to. And I know that there are a number of people that I'm not associated with that have a number of people that are behind them. And just wait, just wait until we all come together. It's called the Liberty Bell. God bless America. Thank you, Eric. Can you please introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my name's Aaron Osterbeck. Um, 
I'm a lifelong Alaskan. Uh, I've been here all my life, and this is my first time actually coming to the Luzak Library to do something like this, to speak in front of the assembly and the mayor. So I'm gonna start out by saying thank you for taking the time. So thank you for that. Um, I, so my story, I've spent 19 years with the healthcare uh, organization, South Central Foundation. 15 of those years have been spent working with a social program called the Elder Program. And um, throughout the pandemic, we've been considered essential uh, in order to um, help provide nutrition services for elders and transportation. Uh, and I just, you know, we've, we've been supporting them all along. And up until now, um, there's been no rhyme or reason or concern up until we've been told that this, these mandates were going to either cause us to lose our jobs or, you know, we opt in for the, the vaccines. And I've not been, uh, in my entire life, I've not been anti-vaccine. Um, I've gotten flu shots. When flu shots first came out, um, I didn't get it right away. I felt like, and I've heard from a lot of other folks that you wait, see what happens, see what you know, see what the outcome is for folks that are taking it. Um, unfortunately, our organization's not willing to do that, um, and so a lot of good folks uh, that have uh, provided uh, time an effort to maintain safety for a lot of the folks in our community are stepping away from their, their jobs. I'm a single father. I have uh, three children. My oldest just graduated just recently. Um, but I just couldn't stand a reason that if I potentially had something happen to me, that couldn't provide for the other two. That's just not in me. Um, it's too much of a risk. So I'm, I'm forced. I'm forced to step away from this position, which I, I care about. I love providing services to our elders, and I love supporting the community, but it's, it's that detrimental to me um, with, with that risk that I, I will step away from my position, and I've made peace with that. I'm also Christian. Um, I've put in my um, uh, request to have that considered, and that was shot down. So. Um, you know, when, when organizations say that you're allowed to do that kind of stuff, but they're not willing to reason with it other than to say it's just too much of a risk for them, why even bother asking your employees? Uh, one last thing I want to say is even though we're doing grassroots here, um, there are things that I'm seeing in the news and I'm paying attention to, and Congress right now has um, set up a bill. Um, I just pulled it up. If, if you just give me one moment. This bill, uh, H.R. 4980, is to direct the Secretary of Homeland Security to ensure that any individual traveling on a flight that departs from or arrives to an airport inside the United States or territory of the United States is fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and for other purposes. This isn't just something that's, that we're fighting against in our communities, our state. Just recently, uh, there was an article that also addressed that our, even our own Senate, the people that are supposed to be representing us are influenced by organizations. It's not right. That's not what they're there to do. They're there to represent the community members. And so thank you for your time. I know I've gone over, but I appreciate you guys listening to me. Hi. Goodness, that's hot. My name is Ryan Graves, and I'm a single mother, and my son goes to East High. Um, I had a call last week. Yes, ma'am. I got a call last week from his school stating that um, he was sick, and she asked if she could have my consent to give him a COVID test. Um, now that morning, he had been throwing up, and often has stomach issues um, and takes heartburn medicine for that. Um, I told him to go to school. I knew it was stomach issues. I, I took his temperature. He didn't have any COVID symptoms. Um, but I let her test him and she said, sorry, she said that until you get your son vaccinated, this will continue and get worse. I'm assuming meaning me leaving school, coming to get him, 
I'm having to be out of school for a test. Um, I'm not against vaccines. I'm not. There's just not enough research on this. According to the CDC's own website, this vaccine is to pre prevent disease. Um, but there's people in the hospital that have the vaccine, that have the disease. There is no science. No one is giving us the answers. They're just telling us to fall in line. There's studies that say this um, can have long-term heart effects on children that are his age, boys specifically. There's heart problems on both sides of his family. So until there's more research, until there's more studies, I don't want my son vaccinated. Um, and this effort to kind of bully me into doing so from ASD is not appreciated. I've stood by, I'm a quiet person. Um, I don't, I emailed them um, and I can read that to you. Uh, I spoke to you on the phone. I'm Walker Mordecai's mother. Uh, that you stated you respected my stance on my child's vet the, and the vaccine, but continued to try and convince me to believe your ideas and persuading attempts to vaccinate my kid. I approved you testing my son on the grounds that he had COVID uh, symptoms and he does not have any of the named symptoms of COVID-19 or the new Delta variant. So I'm writing to understand why, even with no COVID symptoms, are you testing my son? Uh, she responds that she felt, he said that he felt terrible and had been feeling bad yesterday and was getting worse. My job is to keep students in their seats at school to learn, but if a student comes to me not feeling well, and this has been going on for a couple days, I err on the side of caution, request to have them tested. Thank you for letting me do it. I try to make it easy on the parents and have it as, a con as convenient as possible for everyone. Um, but this is one of those presumed cases. This, he would be considered a presumed case under that definition. So this is these, these false numbers that we're getting and um, this really bullying, what's behind this bullying. And I appreciate you for giving me extra time. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Mayor, and to the Anchorage Assembly. I had to practice that and not say Juno Assembly because I'm actually not under your purview. Um, I live in Juno, our beautiful mandated capital. And, um, but I came up here to support some other people and specifically constitutional rights and I really had no intention of coming up to the microphone and I've listened intently for hours now and I really feel like my message to you all is thank you very much because um, I, you have given everyone here, including myself, the opportunity to exercise our constitutional right, our First Amendment right to speak, um, and I don't get to do that in Juneau, in the capital of our state. I didn't, um, when I introduced myself, my name's Shannon Green. I am a retired Coast Guard veteran. I served my country for 31 years, and a uh, Kansas girl. But I uh, came up to um, Alaska in 2014. Um, I was in command of Southeast Alaska for three years. And then the plan was to move back to the East Coast, but we fell in love up here. And I have three boys, I'm a single mom. So we retired up here. And the reason I retired up here is because of any place in the United States where you can have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, there was no going back to the lower 48. So um, I continued to serve my country until 2019 and then retired um, and been full-time mom since then. But I've realized over those past two years, what I've been doing is studying and reading and unplugging from the government that I served. And I love my Coast Guard but um, really learning about the Constitution. So I came up here to support some other people, but I really wanna thank you for giving people a voice. 
I heard a comment earlier is like, well, we're preaching to the choir, everybody's saying the same thing. I said, but what we're saying is we're having an opportunity to be heard um, by you, and that's important, and it demonstrates to others that we cannot be silent, and these stories break my heart. I have two short stories of my boys, and again, it's not under your purview, but my youngest son is in middle school, and um, he's in eighth grade uh, down in Juneau, and on his second day of school, I was called by the principal. Uh, he had been at school an hour and told, I need to come pick up my son because he's exhibiting COVID symptoms. And so I was like, all right, I went and picked him up. He had a headache, and um, just to um, speed up the story, he had been made to run and do kickball for an hour in a mask in the gym, and um, he was deprived oxygen. And so when I went in, I told him, I said, well, did, did he see the school nurse? Have you given him, I give you permission to give him an aspirin, and did you put an oxygen meter on his finger so that you can test his oxygen? They don't have a nurse because there's not nurses per school. They didn't check his oxygen, and I basically told him, I'm like, I sent a healthy son to school um, under your care, and my son is having a reaction to being masked and limiting his oxygen, and you didn't even test him to see if he's okay. So I removed him, and um, I did have a nice discussion with the principal, whom I respect, but I don't agree with their rules, but our kids miss their friends. They miss socializing and my boys we don't mask i believe we had COVID in anchorage thank you very much to the robotics competition we went through that in january of 2020 before COVID was a thing um, but um, that happened and more importantly my oldest son is 19 and i'm gonna try not to get emotional he um i'm fairly certain is a vaccine injured kid he's amazing he is 19 now, and he graduated high school in 2020, the year of COVID. So my brilliant son saved government till last. And so I got to go through government with him online. That was fun, but boy, what a refresher on our constitution. He took a gap year, and then things started to settle down. So we finally said he got accepted to UAF. Um, we moved him up there. We made a vacation out of it so he wouldn't have anxiety. He was accepted to mechanical engineering, got him moved in. He lives on campus. And two days after my son started school at UAF, my brilliant son, who I would die for, uh, the chancellor sent him an email and said, I've decided that despite an 82% vaccination rate, I'm going to mandate vaccines for all kids that live on campus. And he called me and he said, Mom, what do I do? And I said, enjoy school, enjoy your friends. I got this. And um, I'll be engaging not only that school, but the other universities for a lawsuit because it's medical tyranny and it's unfair. And my son deserves to have that education that he's saved for. I just find that it's interesting that after they had my child and we chose them and my veterans funds are flowing that they made that decision that my son had to be vaccinated and he's not going to be but again primarily i want to say thank you for letting us exercise our rights and for being so kind um, with everyone and i appreciate it even though i had to come to a different town to do it but juno needs to do some work thank you Kelly, can you introduce yourself? <laughs> Thank you, Assemblywoman Allard, Mayor Bronson, Mr. Weddleton, and staff. Thank you. Uh, this is my first time at this microphone. Uh, I work for Senator Reinbold, but I am learning to be bold. We've heard from people across the state from nursing homes threatened to lose their licenses people offering the, if, to those who don't offer names, nurses and students facing a choice between employment and education as we just heard. It's happening in my own family. My mom went to the ER in December in another state. She was in an altered mental state because of cancer. Um, I was there just to keep her safe and the nurses, because they were short staffed, kept me there. Um, so that I could stop her from pulling her IV and her oximeter, et cetera. Um, I just have a few points that I want to make about that. 
Um, in the hospital, she was tested for COVID, and when she, w it was quite a process to get that done. When the nurse came back, she was absolutely upset. This woman was very mad that my mother tested negative. Now, I find out for every positive case that the hospital is paid, and I do have a report that shows that in Alaska, it's over $300,000 per patient. I was told once I left the hospital, once my mom left the emergency room, um, that once I left, I couldn't come back. Uh, so I stayed. I stayed for seven days. I stayed in her hospital room. I was not going to leave. Yet nurses left, went home to their family, did their, did their off-duty work, and came back. I stayed because I did not want to be separated from my mother. I waited until midnight to order DoorDash and went down to a kind security guard in the emergency room who allowed me to get my food for the next day. This is America. What's going on here? When I got COVID, I had to go underground because I was told that by my uh, provider at the time that I just had to go home and manage my symptoms. I was very sick. Uh, I had to reach out. Thankfully, because of my network, I learned about Frontline Critical Care Alliance, and I was treated for the root cause. Thankfully, we do have networks available. I couldn't get it from a doctor. I had to go seek it out underground. But the hydroxychloroquine and z pack is what helped me. I have the recordings from local pharmacists who said they absolutely would not fill ivermectin. People are getting blood clots, compartmentalizing, which causes the blood to get in one certain area. They have to go get massages to keep the blood from flowing. I've heard this firsthand. Um, why did the CDC change the definition of a vaccination in September from inoculation to prevention? That's some of the questions that I have. I asked our state chief medical officer in November, you say that this vaccine that's coming is 95% effective. 95% effective of what? From getting the vaccine, from getting the disease, or from minimizing, uh, minimizing symptoms? They said, we don't really know. It's new, we don't know. The recordings are there. They couldn't answer. I said, what if someone had COVID and then gets the vaccine? What are the, um, what are the potential bad side effects? They said, we don't know, can't answer. I believe united we stand, divided we fall, no matter what your choice. If you wanna get the vaccine or the shot, that's your choice. I'm here to support people who are being forced to take the shot or lose their jobs or not be able to be uh, educated in the universities. I thank the active duty, the veterans, and many other front lines who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. Let today be the first day people stand together. May the courage to stand up be just as effect infectious as COVID. Thank you, Assemblymember Allard, Mayor Bronson, and all the state senators and representatives who are under tremendous pressure right now. We must network together, all of us, and share information and support each other. Please join me in focusing in these words, America, the home of the free because of the brave. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nathan Smith. I am a United States Army Infantry veteran with two combat tours to Afghanistan at the height of the Afghan war. Upon returning home, I was told that I was probably not gonna be able to have children. Uh, thankfully, I was able to have one child. You may have seen her today in the assembly, running around her little yellow dress. And uh, when she was born, there was complications at birth where they had to break her bones to get her out because she got stuck. She also had jaundice. So she was in the NICU for a couple weeks. And this was all during COVID. And I was not allowed to touch her. I was able to touch her twice before the hospital came in and told me only one parent can touch her, and it had to be the mother because she had to breastfeed. So I can't tell you how much frustration and anger and resentment I had by not being able to touch my daughter, who was a miracle to me at the time. Looking at her 40 feet away through a plexiglass window, 
I'm a man of few words, so I won't waste your time with facts that these professionals have told you today, but it's unacceptable. Parents should be able to see their children, touch their children, their children need to be touched, especially when they're in pain. That's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. My name is Elsa Tutan. Am I too close? I migrated from the Philippines. The first time I came here in the United States, I feel so blessed, I saw the abundance. I always say this, that I'm so grateful that I came to America, the beautiful, the land of milk and honey. Yes, it is. And we're going to lose it if we're not going to stand up. Stand in faith. I am a Christian. I am a believer of Jesus Christ. I'm standing for that. And we, Christians, we need to stand up and do what is right. We're not going to be ashamed. Because the Bible says, if you are going to be ashamed of me in front of people, I am going to be ashamed of you too in my Father in heaven. So that is my message to all of you. Not we can pray inside, but if you're able to go and do rally, get out there and I rally it for you. Dave Brunson, our mayor, I thank God that you are there. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. All right. Oh. I don't know if this is our last person, but it, it's not. You gave the line. <laughs> okay, go ahead, ma'am. Hello, my name is Francesca. I just also wanted to say that there are doctors who are not seeing their patients because they won't mask or get a vaccination, and I'm one of those, and it's really disappointing. Um, and that's happening on the fifth floor at Regional. Um, there's not many who um, doctors who are in this specialty, and I haven't been in over a year and a half because they won't see me. I can call on the telephone, but that's not health care in a video when they need to look at my body, and they can't evaluate me over the telephone through a video. It's not health care. And first it was, I had to wear a mask, and they were like, well, our heart patients wear a mask, you can do it. We'll make your appointment really quick. You can just do it. 